Hello, everyone. Welcome back for day two of the VizArt Summit 2020 virtual edition. My name is Alex Lehman, and I'm your host for the evening. I am an actor that works in motion capture and voiceover for video games and animation, among other things. We have another fantastic lineup for you tonight, and we're going to jump straight into that in just a minute. The format for tonight is the same as it was last night. We're going to see a pre-prepared video by each of our guests, followed by a roughly 15-minute Zoom conversation with them, where we'll get to discuss the video they've just shown us and their work with questions that we, the VizArts team, have chosen, and with questions that you, the audience at home, are going to ask as well. The way for you to ask a question is to just type it into the YouTube comment section, and then one of the VizArts team will send it on to me to ask on the air. Don't forget, at the end of the evening, we do have a uh, virtual social bar that you can join us with, uh, with GatherTown. And you can find out how to join us there in the Facebook and YouTube descriptions. Now, without further ado, we're going to jump straight in with our first guest, Johannes Wilke from Glassbox Technologies. And he's going to tell us about their virtual camera technology. Hi everyone, my name is Johannes Wilke, I'm executive producer at Glassbox Technologies. And at Glassbox we create virtual production tools that are currently available for Unreal Engine, Unity and Maya. Glassbox was founded roughly four years ago through the coming together of our co-founders who were veterans from the two fields of game engine technology and VFX. And from the beginning, our mission statement was to democratize virtual production tools that were already being used by veterans in the field quite successfully and for a while already, but were not that available yet for a larger array of users. So that's been an interesting journey so far. But especially over the past year, we've seen one change almost level the playing field a little bit in terms of the technology available to all different tiers of users. because. Now, of course, even some high-level cinematographers that would usually have access to large volume motion tracking stages are confined to their home and need to change the way they work. And that's a challenge, but it's also a chance for the technology to evolve. And we've recently published Dragonfly version 2.0, which deals with a lot of these challenges and introduces new options for you to work with. If you know Dragonfly already, then you know that it's our virtual camera tool that allows you to create virtual cinematography within Unreal Engine, Unity and Maya, much the same way that you would create shots with a real world physical camera. So in that sense, uh, this is welcome to my flat cause I want to give you a Dragonfly demo lockdown style. And if you've never seen Dragonfly, then hopefully this will give you a little bit of insight of what the tool can do and what it looks like in action. But this is not going to be a full feature demo. Instead, what I thought I'd do is give you a rundown of what my setup looks like, what technology, what hardware I use. Uh, and so you can see that I have prepared a little bit of that on the table behind me already. And secondly, give you a quick demo of what my workflow for using Dragonfly to create high quality virtual cinematography within Unreal looks like in action. So let's get started with that. For the second part, um, you can see that I have an Unreal test scene here. And after we've set up the hardware, we will do a quick succession of a few shots that we will first block out and then take a few example shots and look at what we can create in just a few minutes here. So to start, as always when using Dragonfly, it's a good idea to connect our iPad. The iPad is not a requirement, but it's a great way to interact with Dragonfly. So we just click on start. And with that, we can move over to my table in the back and connect the iPad. So we open up our Dragonfly companion app from the App Store. We see that the server is already visible here and we just click to connect. And just like that, we are in the Dragonfly app. 
And you can see that we have a viewport and we have a hut at the top and bottom that shows us basic information. And the first thing I want to do as a setup step is customize my hut because I have certain requirements and I want my life to be easier. So first of all, let's go through the hut. Focal length is an information that I don't need because I exclusively work with prime lenses and so I have the lens information in the lens widget already. So I just drag that out. Center is also something I'm not using actively because it's a set and forget it thing for me. Field of view, I want to know, but I'm not working with any uh, focusing data today, so I take out the aperture and the focal distance uh, setting as well. I do want my master sequence time, I do want my lens information, I do want my scaling, and I do want my shot name, but I want to rearrange them a little bit. I want my lens to be at the bottom, my shot name to be at the top, and my master sequence to be at the bottom as well actually. And the reasoning for that is that I want to interact with these two bottom ones. I want to be able to click the master sequence time and scroll through the action of my scene. And I want to be able to click my lens widget and th scroll through my lenses and select lenses from here. I could also work um, with the scaling widget for example, which is also interactive, but that's something, something I'll use they are solved differently. So for me, it's just fine to have these three uh, widgets at the top where they are a little less accessible from my thumb because I don't need to access them. And then secondly, I need a way to control my, uh, my, my camera settings. I need a way to control my movement in the scene. And usually Dragonfly is a tool that works very well with more than one user. Like any cinematography tool, there's a lot of settings to control and it's, it's nice to have someone as the dedicated camera operator and then a second person basically as an assistant camera to change all the settings. But I'm currently alone and I don't have a second person here, so I need to find a workflow that works still. And that's uh, absolutely possible. Typically, in the past, we've recommended using controllers that are able to attach to the iPad, like this GameVise. And this is a great way of giving you additional controls that we can bind Dragonfly actions to. The problems with it is, these aren't readily available, and I don't want to assume that everyone has one of these. So in the Dragonfly 2.0 update, we've brought back on-screen controls. And that means that we can just configure controls on our screen. So you can see that I want to have these two joystick controllers here that I can use to control my camera just like I would with a joystick. And this is not so much for actually doing the cinematography. For that I will still use motion tracking, but I want to have something to move me around in the scene quickly. And another um, part of moving myself around in the scene is being able to rotate myself. So I'm adding two more buttons that are able to rotate myself around in the scene, right? And then a third option for me to move myself around in the scene, just to give myself as much flexibility as possible, is going to be a button that changes my scaling, which is currently at one, which means one meter of physical movement is one meter in the virtual world, to 50. And I will show you in a second what difference that makes. But I can just toggle it back and forth between one and 50, which is super helpful. And then thirdly, I wanted to add, uh, I want to add two more buttons, one of them it's going to uh, do two things at once. It's going to start my recording or stop my recording if I'm already recording. And when I start a recording, it will automatically create a snapshot as well. A snapshot is basically a bookmark in space and time in my scene that remembers my camera settings, my settings for where I am in the scene and in my sequence. And so that allows me to just start recording, but then go back to the beginning of my shot to have a do-over if my idea was good but my shot wasn't that great. 
And then thirdly, uh, to do exactly what I just said, I'll add one more button, which will allow me to go back to my, uh, to my snapshot. So how about motion tracking? I could use my iPad's movement for motion tracking through ARKit and if you have nothing else available then I highly recommend trying it because I think you'll be impressed. ARKit tracking is quite good. However, I want to go one step above that today by using a Vive tracking system. And the benefit of a Vive tracking system is that it's a bit better quality uh, than ARKit tracking. And secondly, it's positionally stable. There's no drift because with these lighthouses, the ARKit tracking system is anchored within your room. So uh, you will always have an exact position without drifting around, which can sometimes occur with a uh, ARKit tracking. The only thing I'm using today is one of these lighthouses, in fact, one that's already installed up there, and then secondly, a Vive tracking puck. And I can just push this button to turn the puck on. You can see this light, the orientation of this light is uh, relevant, and you can see on our iPad that the puck is now already tracking our position in the scene. So to attach the puck to the iPad, I have this clamp, which I can just attach to my iPad in the back. Tighten down the thumb th screw and just like that, I have my iPad and now I can attach my puck on the top, spin it around, make us all a little bit dizzy, so here we go. Cool. Uh, as I said, the position of the light, and that is the same as the charging port, is important. In this configuration, I need to have that pointing at myself. Alright, so you can see now our iPad is motion tracking. And to show you my scaling quick, uh, quick setting, now it's one, you can see that we have not a whole lot of movement, but um, if I push this button once, you can see I get a lot of movement immediately and can fly to a completely different position in the scene, which is super helpful to reposition myself. And then also just to give you a quick demo of, of my recording plus snapshot button, let's say I'm starting a recording here and I'm moving away from this position, I'm flying somewhere completely different right now I'm up here and now if I end my recording I can immediately go back to the beginning of my previous recording and try again iterating across shots quickly. Awesome yeah so that's all of my Dragonfly settings on my iPad. Let's start to do some actual cinematography here. So let's look at what we have in this scene. In this scene, there is this position in the timeline where it turns out that the groom is actually an alien. Oh no, and this is of course a big shock to everyone. And there's this heartwarming goodbye scene where the bride says goodbye and then the groom goes up into his flying saucer and flies away. Yeah. So. My idea for the blocking that I want to do here is I want to take this scene, the, the goodbye scene basically, um, watch from the perspective of the bride how he uh, is encapsulated in this bubble and then moves upwards. Then I want to switch over, basically do a shot from his perspective, looking down at her while he's being moved up. And then thirdly, I think I want to do a shot, there's a balcony in the back here. Yeah, I think I want to do a shot from this balcony, um, looking up at him being lifted into the spaceship and then at the spaceship moving away from him, basically. So yeah. And you can already see how useful the ability to quickly jump back and forth between scaling is for me. Let me make um, your viewport a little bit larger so you can see this better because I think now that's more important than seeing me move around in the scene. 
So let's go to the position that I want to start at, which is right before the piece of ground gets lifted up, which is right around here. And I think I want to start from this position, basically taking the view of the bride and looking at him. And I want to give this shot a name just to be able to work with it a little bit easier in the in the end. And I want to call this shot, um, shot one, goodbye. How about it? Cool. So um, yeah, this was my initial shot. I'm starting a recording, but also creating a snapshot at the same time. You can, by the way, see the snapshot that we just created in our snapshot list here and all further snapshots will also be added here so we can work with them later. Of course, now we jumped back to that snapshot. Let's actually find our position again in the scene. Yeah, right around here. Okay, cool. Let's create our first shot. So recording is started, moves up and away. Okay. Uh, you know what? I think it's okay, but I think we can go better. Let's go back to our original position. There we go. And I think what's actually missing here, I'm moving myself with the joysticks, as you can see, is um, a bit more empathy for her. So I think just being more behind her, doing this more as an over the shoulder shot is probably a good idea. So let's start a recording from here and also create a new snapshot in, in case we need a do over. So yeah, she looks at this, moves back, a little of dissociation going on. We can actually move in a little bit, follow the rock being pulled up. Yeah, I think that's much better. Let's take a quick look at what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. I think this is a much better shot. We can also immediately apply a little bit of smoothing to look at what this would look like with a little bit of post-processing. Yeah, awesome. Okay, I think this is what we want. Cool. And then I said um, we want to do a second shot that is from his perspective. Let's go to our previous snapshot. Uh, yeah, I think the time of our previous snapshot was actually good. Um, ju let's just turn ourselves around and move behind him as he stands here a little bit up maybe. Yeah, I think this is probably a good position. Maybe, um, yeah, no, no let's, let's actually start it from here and just look at what it looks like. One thing um, we do need to do though is attach ourselves to him because uh, let's look at what happened if we just started a shot from here right now. You can see the ground would move through us, right? That's just one of the sad limitations of being in a virtual world. But we can easily deal with this by using Dragonfly's platforming feature, just selecting him as our platforming target. And now as he is being moved through the scene, we will be moved with him. So let's create a shot and a snapshot here. And as we are being lifted up, you can see us being lifted up with them. Okay, uh, good shot in principle. I do want to be able to continue to see her though. So let's go back at that snapshot position. Actually, I'm gonna move a little bit back. So here's our snapshot position. And I'll just try and do the same shot again, maybe a little bit over to the side, but with larger motion. Uh, so I can keep her in frame as well. So let's try that. So we're seeing this. We are being moved up, hopefully. Yeah, there we go. And we can see her being kept in, mo in the frame as well. Cool. Um, let's take a look at what that shot looked like. Apply a little bit of smoothing as well. So we'll probably cut away the first few seconds of this, but there we are being lifted up. We have that higher vantage point. Um, yeah, I think our motion came in a little bit late actually. Let's, let's do one more. Let's go back to our shot. 
Um, let's actually move our action ahead just a hair here, just to the beginning. Okay. And then let's try one more time. Moving to, yeah, this position is probably good. Okay, let's try one more time. We're being moved up. Big motion to keep looking at her. Yeah, how about this? Good shot, you tell me. Yeah, yeah, I think with smoothing, this is exactly what we want, right? Yeah, awesome. Cool. Uh, by the way, we didn't rename our shot, so now we have to look for it, which is, of course, uh, not ideal, but we'll manage. We can rename it later. So let's uh, do our third shot, which I said was a shot from the balcony over there. I'm using my scaling quick change, which, on, which honestly is my favorite way of interacting with uh, this scene. Cool, so this is our position where we want to be, right? And we wanna be standing here and look at this piece of ground, where is it? As it's being pulled up, right. Uh, one thing we need to do though, is we need to uh, unplatform, because of course that's a setting that we only needed in the last scene. Okay, let's go down a little bit. So we're standing on the terrace again. And then let's find our position in this scene. So I want to go to where, yeah, roughly around here, where the ground is in the air and being lifted up. And I think what I also want to do is use a narrow lens, maybe a hundred Five, maybe actually even more narrow, maybe like 200. Yeah, how about this? Let's use this lens. Cool. And then we will see it go up into the spaceship, the, the hatch closing, and then the spaceship fly away. Let's not make the same mistake that we did last time. Uh, instead, let's actually rename our shot. So this is going to be shot three. We skip, skip shot two, and this is uh, fly away. Yes, awesome names all the way. Okay, cool. Um, let's create this shot. Again, as I push record, I'm also creating a snapshot, so I can go back if this isn't the best. Being lifted up, latch closing, and then where is it flying away? There it is flying away. Okay, awesome. Okay, um, I think this works. I uh, just think that I need a little bit more control. And one thing I can do in Dragonfly to cheat is to change the speed at which my sequence is being played back. So let's set that to a two. And that means that now my sequence is gonna be played back at half the speed while I'm recording, but my final recording will still be um, the original speed. So let's move back to the snapshot, there we go, and create another recording at half the speed. So you can see how slow it's being moved into the spaceship now. Hatch is closing. There we go. Of course, this is twice as fast in the final recording and there we are flying away. And in the second tier, we will see the spaceship fly up. Let's capture all of that actually. Let's not follow that movement though. Instead, it'll fly through the top of the frame and that is our shot awesome thank you very much let's take a look at what this shot looked like smoothed Awesome. I think this is good, right? Cool. So thank you so much for joining me in this little demonstration of what my personal Dragonfly 
workflow looks like when working at home with one person with a Vive system and using this as an environment that gives me all the tools I really need to create high quality cinematography. If you want to check out uh, Dragonfly 2.0, it's of course available from our website. You can uh, just download a free 30-day trial and start playing around with it. And if you have any questions, generally, always shoot us an email. We always are super happy to engage and respond quickly. And now, of course, I'm uh, looking forward very much to your immediate questions. So that was Johannes Wilke from Glassbox Technologies talking about their virtual camera system. We now have Johannes online, live on Zoom, and we're going to go directly to a conversation. Hello, Johannes. Hey. Hey, Hi. welcome back to VizArts. Hey, thank you. Nice to be back. Yes, good. Um, so thank you very much for that video. Uh, it's really cool. I like the way you framed it as a, uh, if I'm stuck at home, during COVID, how can I uh, use your tools? That was a perfect, uh, perfect demonstration of that. Um, I wanted to start out asking you, because um, watching the video, I felt like it was clear that you, uh, you're not just showing off the technology. You, you, know, you're, you, you really are going through the thought process of someone using Dragonfly to shoot something. Do you, yeah. um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and the, 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 the background of the people that started Glassbox? And, and, um, what sort of drew you, you know, do you have come from a film background or a tech background or what, what, what made you decide you wanted to um, get into this field and develop this tool? Sure. I mean, and honestly, it's really not hard to put ourselves in the shoes of people actually using this tool, because especially over the past year, the question like, how can we make um, these tools work, especially for environments where people are working, like also professionally from home, is mm. like really something we've been asked so many times. So yeah, like mm. that's, that's our day to day. Uh, things to talk about. But yeah, so uh, Glassbox was um, founded four years ago. Um, I, I already said uh, in the video, we like came from two different backgrounds, uh, VFX, the movie uh, world, and then a uh, game engine technology. And I think um, you could say that basically the idea for the company emerged when these two different groups of people met and were going like, going like, wait a second, we're talking about the same technology here. We're all interested in game engine technology somehow, but we're from completely different backgrounds. We are doing completely different things. So like what's going on here? And then of course, like with looking into that deeper um, virtual production is just something that um, yeah brings these people together. Yeah, cool. And um, like, then also in terms of like the company background larger, we've uh, interacted with, um, like big partners from the beginning, HTC, who produces mm. the Vive was a big help for us. We've like worked with um, the third floor, like one of the largest previous previous companies worldwide from, from the beginning. And they've been really instrumental in like honing in how like virtual camera, for example, should work for a large production mm -hmm. uh, as well. So yeah, that's been super helpful there. Okay, actually, can you say a bit more about um what sort of input did they give? What was the partnership like? Were they sort of advising you along the way or, or how did that work exactly? Yeah, so I mean, um, obviously we didn't invent the idea of a virtual camera, right? And mm -hmm. Third Floor is probably one of the companies who's worked with this concept for the longest. And so when we um, started building this company, they really um, gave us a head start in thinking about what um, a VCAM should do and how it should behave and what to consider in terms of data management, all the things that you wouldn't initially think about, but that are really instrumental to setting up a professional pipeline as well that, that mm. works in production um, on the day-to-day -day business. So um, yeah, they just were really helpful partners in uh, figuring out how these tools are being used in the industry. And of course, like we brought our own backgrounds from the industry as well, mixing it with that. And since then, obviously, we've had input from a lot of other users. And honestly, the, the process has probably been um, taken a tool that's um, extremely centered around industry professionals and mm -hmm. then expanding its capabilities to also include um, lower budget productions and also um, just entry users. So mm -hmm. uh, hopefully making this a tool that is super capable, but also uh, low entry in a way. Mm. Yeah, 
Cool. Um, so you 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 came and talked to us about Dragonfly last year uh, as well. Yes. And um, can you say a bit about uh, what's happened in the in the year in between? How um, how have things oh, developed, yeah. and where are you this so year much. as in, compared to last year? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've we've done a bunch of things. We've had multiple product releases. I mean, Dragonfly is one of our tools. We mm-hmm. also have a Live Client, which um, is a way to bring um, facial facial tracking data into Unreal. And then we also have Beehive, which is our data management tool, which right. is what you will need if you start working with Dragonfly on a larger scale. You suddenly run into problems and then Beehive is going to be there to solve those problems for you. And we've mm-hmm. had multiple product releases for these products, but we've also uh, worked with a lot of clients. Um, we've uh, interacted with a few film schools, which was cool. We've built um, virtual stages, we're involved in that type of thing. But then the biggest thing was probably just everything that came along with COVID, you know, cause suddenly, um, we like the interest in our tools become became really urgent where people Mm. previously said that's like amazing technology i can think of ways of using that in our production people were suddenly like oh my god we're at home we need to continue to working we need your tools now you know like with like um this urgent need for (laughs) implementation um yeah and then also just the shift to people working from home was really interesting because traditionally of course these tools were used in stage environments like Mm. in production studios with people being on on site but it turns out they're also um quite applicable for working from home but of course that was a little bit of a shift in how we explain these tools to people and also what we bring to these tools you can see that like the dragonfly 2.0 update that i talked about is primarily focusing on things that people need more uh, need more now than previously because they are working from home and Mm. that includes high-end productions as well where dps are just working uh, on their own from their own uh, flat with other people um, like remoted in so to say yeah yeah um, talking about remoting in, uh, are you, because um, you mentioned that the, in the video that, you know, maybe the ideal setup would be that you have one person operating the camera and another person adjusting the settings. Is mm-hmm. that something that, that you can, is that a process that you can actually do across distance so that the person adjusting the settings might be in the UK and the other one is in, in Germany? Um, or does that sure. still have to happen in the room? No, I mean, that that can happen remotely too. I have to say that, I mean, I hope that with this setup, I gave a little bit of, of an idea of how flexible the system is. Everything that I set up, for example, is super customizable as well. So you can absolutely work with one person doing this. But yeah, um, you can work with uh, two people remotely too. I think the thing you need to consider is that if you're going remote with um, stuff that requires live rendering, there are just technical things to consider. For example, you should probably uh, have the rendering for your virtual camera in the same location that the VCAM operator is too, just mm-hmm. because you, then you don't have to stream your viewport data back and forth, which will just mm-hmm. introduce lag. So we recommend um, having one machine that runs the scene where the camera operator is, but then of course you can um, bring in a second person through a remote connection, just um, turning uh, knobs for them, just changing camera setting. Yeah, that's absolutely possible. Okay. Yeah. That's also part of how we will probably extend the, um, uh, the the tools further in the future with more things that make stuff like that even easier. But yeah, mm. absolutely possible. Cool. Uh, we have a two-part question from the audience here. Uh, mm-hmm. Henrik asks, and this, the first part of the question is, uh, what do you need to get started besides the tracker and iPad and the software, uh, both in terms of um, hardware-wise and skills? Right. So, I mean, the easiest way to get started really is just to have an iPad. Um, Again, the iPad is not required. You could also use an external monitor. But the benefit of having an iPad is the fact that you don't even need a tracker because an an iPad is effectively a tracker. There's an arcade in there, which is surprisingly good. Um, And we see that being used in high-end productions as well. They like even productions that use like uh, optical systems, OptiTrack for the actual uh, motion capture 
in production, they often play around with the system just using ARKit up front, just to mm. um, play around with some uh, things, experiment a little bit. So if you have an iPad, then you're good to go. And then if you want to take it one step further than that with like um, noticeably improved tracking as well, you can buy uh, an, a Vive system for a couple of hundred dollars. So like the barrier of entry in terms of technology is, is really low. Mm. Did that, I think you said two-part question, right? Did that cover the yes. second part as well? The second part is, uh, do you plan to develop for Android as well? Oh, right. Um, yeah, so we don't currently have a version for Android right now. Um, but the way that our app is developed, we could um, easily deploy it for Android as well. And the reason we don't do that yet is just because we don't see the demand. But if uh, you are interested in using it on Android, then just shoot us an email, and then I'm sure we can uh, take that into consideration. Yeah. Cool. Good. Um, <clears throat> Does the, uh, the, in the demo that you showed, um, obviously you're working on a scene that's sort of uh, pre-recorded and, and you can kind of, you know, all the, all the mm -hmm. motions and animations are in place and you can kind of fly around and figure out where you want to, uh, to shoot from. But um, does it also work in, in sort of a live shooting context? Could you take it to, could you use the Dragonfly on a, on a mocap stage or on a, you know, an LED screen stage or, or w what else can it do besides working with a pre-recorded scene? Sure. I mean, um, in principle, uh, Dragonfly is just a camera that flies around in your Unreal scene. So whatever you can get into your Unreal scene, you can look at it through the eye of a virtual camera. So absolutely, you can also do live stuff. One mm -hmm. thing that I sometimes say when people ask us that question is, do you really need to do it live? Because mm -hmm. there, like some benefits of virtual production come in the fact that you can do things sequentially, that you can do motion capture first, clean it, think about it, and then record it over and over mm. until you have the perfect shot. So if that's applicable, I think sometimes people coming from a live, live environment don't realize the opportunities that are in uh, doing the production live, but not at the same time, so to say. Mm. Uh, but yeah, if you need or want to do everything at the same time, sure, why not? Yeah, yeah. Cool, good. Thank you. Um, I have another audience question here. This one says, uh, do you need a PC? Uh, and what is the graphic power needed? I'm not sure if PC in this context is being used specifically to mean um, a non-Mac computer or, or if it can be run off something other than a computer. But yeah, the question yeah, as written so is, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like you need to have some form of hardware that um, runs the system. Um, the benefit with like Dragonfly uh, and all of our plugins is that they are engine plugins. So if you have a PC, for example, that is already running your Unreal project, then you know that that machine is capable of running that Unreal project. I mean, we do have hardware recommendations on our website as well. If you're interested, you can take a look. But in principle, if your system is able to run your scene, then it'll be able to run Dragonfly as well. Dragonfly itself as a super lightweight uh, process, the, the demanding thing is rendering your scene in the first place. And that's already mm. happening. Uh, yeah. Yep. So basically, you can run Dragonfly off of any machine that's already running your, your project, Yeah, basically. any machine yeah. that's already running the Unreal or Unity or Maya, whatever the system yep. is you're using scene, that like will also be perfectly capable of running Dragonfly with it. Yeah. OK, cool. Yep. Uh, we have another question here. Um, can a director just go and use it? I guess the question there is, is mm -hmm. there a, a sort of barrier to use, uh, a knowledge barrier, or, or could someone kind of just pick it up and, and, and go? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like actually like the question is worded because I, I think that's often how it feels that you, that you can just go and use it because it's really low barrier of entry. Entry, you need obviously you need to have an environment. You need to somehow start the engine, um, put the plugin in there, which is also super easy. But you need to um, set that up. Um, but then you can just hand this tablet to someone and tell them here, this is basically like a real camera. And they go like, huh? Okay move around with it and realize that it's actually like a real camera. It's a, it's a, mm. it's a physical object that you hold. It, it has a viewport like a physical camera. So you're interacting with it in much the same way that you would with a physical camera. And so if you are versed in cinematography, but not the technology side, and this is probably a perfect place to start, just get a little bit of help with setting up the system or take an hour to learn how to do that. We have tutorials and we have like 
uh, instructions for that. So that's not something that will hold you back. But then the actual artistic side of things um, is designed to be as close to what uh, camera people already know mm, cool. as possible. Good. And I, I noticed that I thought it was pretty cool in the video that you you seem to put some effort in the, the new version into making the interface as customizable as possible so someone can just set right. it up however they want it. Um, yep. Alan yep. asks, uh, does it fully integrate with Unity? Uh, and then an apology, mm -hmm. sorry if that's already mentioned. But the question is, yeah, does it fully integrate with Unity? Yeah, so we have the same thing as Unity plugin as well. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks um, as similar to the Unreal plugin as it can in terms of like how the Unity UI looks a little different, but it's the same buttons in the same places and stuff like that. There are obviously differences between Unreal Engine and Unity. So one example of that would be the buttons that you saw me place on screen. Um, those are fully customizable with everything that we let that Dragonfly could do by using Unreal Blueprint functions. And of course, Unreal Blueprint functions functions don't exist in Unity, but in Unity, you can write a C-sharp script that does exactly the same. We also have our API exposed in Unity, so you can do the same things um, uh, in the uh, best way for that particular system that you're working with. So it works with Unity, but the, 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 the user might need to customize it a little bit more than they would if they were using it. Yeah, I mean, uh, not really. Like the, oh, no, okay. the everything that's there out of the box is uh, there out of the box in the same way. And the things that you can customize, you can customize similarly. I mean, there's a little bit of difference in how you interact on the like granular level with these engines. And of course, there's a bit of a difference, but we have instructions for all of those. So if you're coming from one system, then you can probably immediately start on the other one as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Johannes. That's, uh, that's, that's all the time we have for the moment. Uh, but thank you so much for coming back and for presenting Dragonfly to us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. Take care. So that was Johannes Wilke from Glassbox Technologies talking about their Dragonfly virtual camera system. Now we're going to go and talk to Tommy Tor Ibsen from Marionette. He's going to talk about his virtual reality motion capture system. Hello, my name is Tommy Tor Ibsen. I am CEO and product director here at uh, Marionette. Marionette is a software that lets you record and edit motion capture with uh, a VR headset and controllers. So more and more creators are realizing that that being inside VR and creating inside VR is, is it's, it's really fun, but it's also really fast. And if you then combine that with the opportunities of motion capture, you can actually make content very fast and uh, very fun. <laughs> and I've been looking for a long time and I've been talking with a lot of other directors and creators about like getting the right tools and software to do this. And the thing is that it's not really out there, at least not to the, to the extent that I want it. <laughs> uh, so, so when I got the opportunity to create exactly the software that I think that we need and that I've been talking with a lot of creators about that we need, then I jumped on it and this is why we are creating MyNet. So VR gives us this great opportunity to be inside a world while we record motion capture. Another thing is that it does is that it pushes the, the boundaries for technology. It makes it much more affordable to get trackers for motion capture because it's already in the VR equipment. Of course, you can't record motion capture the same way that you usually do where, with like a full body suit and stuff, but you can, you can record motion capture in layers. So now let's jump into VR and see how it is to work in layers with MyNet. Now we're in MyNet and we need to calibrate. We do this by putting our arms together and pushing the trigger button. Now we can, we can adjust some more of our proportions, but right now I think it's fine, so I'll just go OK. So now we're in the editing mode and we're in a project by Frederik Willemsen that is a short film that has been commissioned by Unity and we are very grateful to be able to help on working on this project. As you see here, we have an animatic that is running on a timeline. And up here, we have a preview window. We will come back to that. First of all, we will look here and we can see there is some animation where this guy over here will start walking. 
So what we can use this for is we can record in layers on top of this. What we want to do to start with is that we want to get in a good position to see how we're going to record his arm movements. And we, we do that by simply going a, a little further to the character. And right now, I think I want to turn around here and and I think this is this is a good a good angle for me. And I will go into recording mode. In recording mode, you can see you have the timeline, but just a slim down version. But this makes sure that you can always see where you are in your recording. And you can see that the arms is already moving and he's ready. So let's start doing some mocap. I'm going to choose record. And now we're going to walk because we love walking and talking and walking and talking. It is our favorite thing. Thank you so much. Good. Now we can come back to our preview window. And this is actually where you see how much my net is just like editing video. Because up here you have a preview window where you can where you can sort of go through your animation and you also have the audio. Let's just say that we want this from the start and we go we can make an in point and we can make an out point. We think it's good till there and of course we can shuffle back and forth like this. And then I'm just going to drag it this drag it to the timeline and then then we can play it. Let's do that. And now we have the character walking and talking. And this is sort of the core of my net is that you can record motion capture in layers. And of course you can do like any other, if we, we can do more takes and you will do more takes. And then when you have the more takes, you can take them and you can put them to the timeline. And then of course, this is also an audio recording program. So this will sync with our animation. Yes, that is the core of it. Sometimes you may have, may have lots of take and a lot of materials, and it's more comfortable to edit that in a, a desktop workflow. So that's why we also have a desktop version of our software. Let's jump into that. So now we're in the desktop version of uh, MyNet, and you can jump in and out of this, this just as you like. So whenever you take off your headset, you will basically get uh, teleported into this uh, workflow. And you can see that this really works like any other uh, video editing software, where you can you can mark in, you can mark out, uh, you can uh, you can delete, you can take down another take. You can blend them together. Yeah, really like any other video editing software. And that is one of the things we want to do with MyNet is we want to make you able to create motion capture as long as you just know how to video edit. And then when you're ready and you want to export, you just choose in and out and you can export it to FBX or any other format that is standard for, for 3D export. Uh, and of course, we're also working on streaming directly into uh, Unity and Unreal Engine and Blender and so on. That's it for the desktop application. We're in the beta phase right now and we're learning and we're developing the software. So if you're a creator and you have a project where you think something like MyoNet would be awesome. I mean, we are looking for collaborators right now to uh, sort of work on the beta version of the software. So please hit us up on social media or go to our website and sign up for the beta. So that was Tommy Tor Ibsen from Marionette XR talking about their virtual reality motion capture system. And we've got Tommy on the line now and we're going to go straight to a conversation. Hello, Tommy. Hi, Alex. How's it going? Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting that uh, the, the work you've been doing with Marionette XR. Um, 
My first question, I, um, I know from, from working with you in the past that you, um, you have a background as a uh, storyteller and filmmaker and animator. Um, and so, and you talk a lot in the video about how you, um, you know, you sort of, you, you felt like there was a, a need for this kind of tool in your personal creative process. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, yeah, what, what was that, that need? Because I know um, from, from the time before you, you started Marionette um, that you were, you were always trying to fit, find a good virtual reality motion capture um, solution. It, seemed, it seems like it's been a theme with you for a long time. Um, and yeah, can you talk about where, uh, where that came from in your creative process? Well, well, it comes from wanting to be able to uh, create, create together in VR mm -hmm. and to, to create fast. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's, very that, it's really that simple. I want to tell stories and that's what's important to me. Mm -hmm. And everything else is sort of just noise. <laughs> uh, so how can we get as fast as possible to telling good stories? That's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that when you go into a VR space, you can be there together, no mm -hmm. matter where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. And you, you can sort of interact with the scene and, and, and you can be physical in a totally other way than you normally do if you work with animation or visual effects or mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, traditional that stuff. Cool. It, so, is it fair to say, in a way, then, that you um, you don't like the interruption of having to go like, okay, now we've shot our motion capture. Now I'm going to go over to my computer and do this thing. You kind of want to be able to just be there, working with the material directly the whole time. Exactly. That's 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 the whole idea. Is that because you know, working with normal motion capture is is fun and stuff, but you, you, there's so much stuff you need to do. It's the same when you're on a film set. You have to set up so much stuff. And being very inspired by the gaming industry, which I, I also have played a little with, uh, you know, it's it's just fun to just go in there and, and do it, mm. you know, and, and and record something, and then oh that didn't work, let's record something new and edit in the process and just have like a fluent creation process mm. instead of you know these steps that we sort of know from filmmaking where you know you go. So it's more like a a, a round you know circularized process. Really. Yeah. Cool. Good. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> now, this company. Um, tell me if I get any of these details wrong. But the um, the uh, technology that you're working with, it started out as a as as a somebody else's project. Is that right? It's basically a, it was another startup. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of startups uh, doing uh, motion capture, and the founders uh, left it. And one of the things is I've been doing is I've been complaining to a lot of other startups. <laughs> about a lot of things that I needed uh, and that I didn't think that people were building. And then I got the chance to uh, like to build what I want and what I need. So, so I jumped on that. And, cool. and and I got to create like a pick a whole new team. So so uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's what uh, yeah created my net. Cool. So, um, can you tell us then a bit about that process? Like, how um, how long ago did you did you take over the the project, and what's it been like, um, sort of building on top of that that uh, having the chance to take something that you'd worked with and seen all the what you what you felt like could be better about it, having the chance to work on it. What's the process that you've been through, and and where are you trying to take it right now? Um, well, the process has sort of been like <laughs> uh, changing it completely. <laughs> yeah. So what you can say is that the, the what the software was before was basically a feature that we are going to like uh, uh, take in again at some point, but it was like a feature in what we are building now, which is something much larger. Um, so it's it's really it's really not the same anymore. Uh, yeah. it, it hasn't got a lot to do with what it was before. Okay. Uh, but the feature that the thing we're building on top of will be represented again. And we are sort of building on, on that um, baseline of, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. Um, <clears throat> let me see here. So uh, you were talking about um, that one of the one of the things that really fascinated you about being able to, to do this with, with uh, virtuality is to is to have a team collaborating all together in a space. So can you talk a bit about um, how far along are you in terms of integrating uh, you know, virtual collaboration tools into the, 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 the program and 
um, you know, do you have a sense of how many people are going to be able to, to sort of be present in a, in a shoot at the same time? And, and where, where are you going in terms of um, yeah, sort of virtual uh, collaboration? Well, that really depends on on, on the on the networking. Uh, it's it's not really our software. It's, it's more mm. like how, how many people can can be together on a server at the same time. So that that you have your question there is is like uh, how many people can be uh, together on the server at the same time. Yeah. Um, we are working towards that right now. We are very much in the beta phase, and we are re re focusing on very few creators uh, mm -hmm. and really working together to with them to you know learn what what really we need to do with this tool um so we are working on a lot of things of course we also we and we you know face and hand capture and all these things like it is very much in the pipeline and we mm -hmm. are we already have some things that we are testing internally um so yeah uh, that's good Cool. Can you say anything? You just mentioned hand capture, and I know that the, is the current system that you're using. You have are you using the the VR controllers still in the current system? And if I mean, so, yeah. Thing came along. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if you've heard, but it, this uh, the this is one of the headsets that it cost like two uh, two thousand krona uh, plus mops, mm -hmm. uh, and everybody can really go out and get it, and it has hand tracking and stuff, and all the other headsets will fall. Okay. So. That's the short version. So it's it's optical hand tracking that you're looking. Oh into. yeah, sorry. So it's 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 optical, and again, it's the whole idea of doing things in layers because, of course, if, when you don't have, uh, like, uh, you, if, if you don't want to use a suit and you know put all uh, things on and, and all that, and you just want to you know stay in front of your desk, really, uh, you, it's it's fine to recall things in layers uh, as it, it did there, and the same thing. It's actually very intuitive to. First, just record a character that is, you know, acting out, and then after that, saying, "Okay, hold up your hands and you know, move your hands while you see the recording." And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in in that sense, um, I wanted to ask you in the video that you showed, you have the because you're talking about uh, doing the mocap in different layers. Um, so in, in the video, you're, you're recording the, the hand gestures of the, the character. How was the, in, in that example, how was the, the walk created? Is that a, a motion capture walk or is that a, um, is that a sort of, um, what's the word, is that a, is that a pre-recorded walk or how? So is, is recording a walk part of the process that you're looking at right now? I mean, we are looking into different uh, ways of doing that also. One of the things that we are looking into is using as few tr trackers as possible, mm -hmm. and then also using all the benefits of what's happening with machine learning and, and so on and so on to, to move a character. Uh, but uh, just short version, that you see there is that just pre-recorded uh, walking, yeah. and there are different ways of stylizing and, and uh, working with uh, pre-recorded uh, walking animations and also combining motion matching uh, and so on. It's also, of course, also things we're looking for uh, in the future. But right now, it's, it's really easy just to go to Mixing or something and, and download you know, some yeah. motion capture. Cool. Uh, we have a question from the audience here. Do you see any future in VR and filmmaking and how? Why is this a good tool for that? Uh, I don't know if, if the person asking has tried our VR, uh, because it's, it's actually really hard to, to say. But the thing is, when you're in VR, you're in space. Yeah. And you can do what you can do in any other space. You just don't have to be where you are now physically. Mm. So that's the short version of it. You can really go in a plan a scene. So right now, of course, it's really good for just doing uh, previous and stuff like that. It's insanely fast to, you know, just because you have a virtual camera and you can get whatever camera and lens you want, you know, you can, uh, uh, yeah, you can jump around in a ways that you can't jump around in reality. You can teleport and stuff like that. You basically have superpowers. So it's like making movies with superpowers in a virtual okay. space. Making money with making movies with superpowers. That could be the, uh, the motto for the company. Um, <laughs> cool. We have another question. Um, Henrik asks, uh, what would you need from the people who could help you with beta testing in terms of skills or their own hardware, that sort of thing? Um, skills and, and being eager to learn, being able to, like, 
we actually right now we're looking for for, uh, for for interns who want to really get into the creation process with VR and, and we so right now we actually we, we have a, a production uh, right now that is also running that is uh, kind of our own um, that uh, we're, we are producing it a little slower than we usually would because we we are just very, we want everything to be created inside. Uh, so this is an, actually an AR project, but we, as much as possible, trying to use all the, the benefits and all and learning these tools. So we we are interested in people who's excited about working in in VR and and, and what that can uh, give. And that's especially like considering sculpting and modeling, which mm -hmm. is the two things. And a lot of people think that it's only just you know modeling uh, you can you can do, but you can actually also. Uh, sorry, it's only sculpting, but you can actually also do modeling. You can actually do finished uh, objects. And again, you can work very fast in these mediums uh, if you just train and learn how to use them. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, have, we, we have a lot of hardware, so we can, you know, yeah. find, when people work with us, we, we, have, we have equipment. Yeah. So, so it's the skills and the, the willingness that we, we, we're looking for. Okay. Um, Cool. Um, I, I didn't see, I don't think you mentioned it in the video. Um, are you able to interact when you're, if you're working on a scene in the, within Marionette, are you able to interact with the environment as well? Uh, yes, you, you, you will be. Um, mm -hmm. at, at this point, you're not, but it is one of the things that we're working on. Yeah. And again, right now, like, and I also want to say this, we don't just, now we're talking about what we are doing ourselves, but we're really interested. If you're out there, if you're a creator, and you have an awesome project where you think our tool would be good, like, uh, please uh, hit us up. Uh, of course, I said that in the video. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, and then uh, I also want to ask, what do you, since you've been around in the, the, the virtual production uh, world here for a while, or you know, playing with all the different tools over the course of the last few years. Um, where do you see? How, how do you see the? What stage of development do you think the Danish vir um, virtual production uh, world is at at the moment? And, and sort of how do you see it developing? And what do you think needs to happen to to, to keep it moving forward? Uh, people's eager, people being eager to learn and being able to sort of let go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really simple. It's it's the it's that people dare jump in there, okay, and to realize that this is this will just improve production in so many ways, and people just need to start to realize that, and then the people who start realizing will get in front of the other people because they will get more value for less money. Hmm. It's that simple. Hmm. Cool, good. I think that's all the questions that we have for the evening. Um, so. Thank you very much, Tommy, for presenting Marionette XR to us. And good luck in the, the beta testing and development phase. And um, yeah, it's always good to see you. Thank you. Uh, and I just uh, want to say that uh, mm -hmm. hit me up on my email, <laughs> yeah. and, and I'll, be, I'll be out uh, in, the, in, in the Hangout afterwards. Uh, um, but I can, I can post my email if you want to get in contact. Yeah, good. You, you, I think if you put it in the, you can put it in the comment section under YouTube right after this. So yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Take care, Tommy. Bye. Bye. So that was Tommy Tor Ibsen from Marionette XR talking to us about his virtual reality-based motion capture system. Now we're going to talk to Jonathan Nielsen from uh, the Norwegian company Loading and their video game project Last Days of Snow. I am uh, Jonathan Nielsen. I am the co-founder of Loading and uh, the director and lead developer of Last Days of Snow. Today I'll talk a little bit about the game and how we work and also show you guys some, uh, some of the gameplay itself and some of the cutscenes we've been working on and um, also show a short little teaser that uh, will give you some of the atmosphere of, of the game.
had a dream. It was a bit strange. A voice kept guiding me around, asking me questions in this giant forest. Morning, Oski! Hey, Eva. Can I... Can I steer today? Hey, Oscar. Hey, uh, Eva. Growing up in Norway, we tried to, I really want the, the player to be able to experience this, this atmosphere and, and um, how it really was to, to go to school in, in Norway when, um, when everything is dark in wintertime. And, uh, you know, there's so many small details in, 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 a, in an experience like that that needs to be right. And so using tools like Unreal Engine and amongst others, uh, we're able to, to really tap into that uh, and, and really get to work on, on, uh, on making a world and also making a story and making a setting uh, from the get-go. So one example is, is, for example, the snow that we're able to create. So it's, it's very important for me that it, that it twinkles a bit like, like the snow really does and, and uh, that, you know, on the other side of snow, there is this, in the shadow area, it needs to be, has it have the, this blue hue. And working with Unreal Engine and since everything is in that world we're able to experiment with both materials um, putting the characters in and doing the scanning and, and actually setting these these characters in the world and see how that feeds back and then um, we can work on so many multiple layers at the same time which is is quite quite interesting uh, when it comes to world building gameplay all this feeds back into, into, into story and the story feeds back into the gameplay. Hello? Hi, hi, it's me. Hi, Leif, is, is everything all right? It's, it's pretty early. So working with games or a, a project like this and compared to film, you know, I think you, in, in games you have to work so much before you're even though or you can start filming really or you can start pointing your camera because because there is no world really um even doing tests you're, you're not really allowed to see what the world might look like um and so we've been sitting for for um, you know one and a half a year before even starting to point the camera at the actors or really doing doing tests how does this look in the world and that can fi f seem quite tiresome sometimes you know you, you don't see the output and you don't get to be that creative with lights and stuff because so many technical things needs to be in place but then once you are there as we are in the state now you basically you're free to do whatever you want because you have this world you have the interior of an apartment you haven't you know you're just free to move things around scale things um even even when the actors have done their movements you know we have you're, you're you have the movements and then you place the camera there and you're able to to make these uh, these shots and really experiment and you the, really the sky is the limit there so so creatively it can start off as a bit limiting and you know you, it feels draining to not be able to to really um you know, you, you feel really that you're a bit of a hacker, really, or a coder, or, you know, there's so many things that need to be in place. And then suddenly there's this beautiful moment where you, you are just so free to, um, to do whatever you want and experiment and innovate creatively. For the photogrammetry, what was really nice there to work with FBFX is that they have this amazing setup with, uh, I can't remember how many cameras there were, but we have scanned several characters and uh, we're using the actors um, as they look so we're able to scan these really high detailed 3d meshes of them which we then again add blend shapes to which then makes for the the facial movement 
and these are then imported into the game and we can then motion capture it. Um, it's quite interesting process, the whole thing. We, we see it down to the poor details. We can get those close-up shots that we want. And we have to remove all the hair because the hair is all messy. We make them pretty much bald and um, we then need uh, uh, to, to add, add hair back in. Um, but that's been, been great as well, working with, with um, all the shader textures in, that exists in, in Unreal. Also eyes, the eyes are a very difficult, um, difficult material to make really because uh, you need to get all that, um, you know, how, how, the, how lights, light really refracts inside of the eyes is quite difficult to replicate. And uh, thanks to Epic that has shared a lot of their materials and a lot of their workflows and, and, uh, and research on these type of materials like eyes and skin, it's been much easier to um, to wrap wrap my head around how that works and then to get something that actually works quite well. So with a with a small team, we're able to deliver something that looks quite good. So for facial expressions, we need to have smiles, open mouth, which we then in turn assemble um, into a package or a character that that can move like that. This is all then driven. These characters are then driven by the motion capture recording we do with Centroid 3D. Um, we, have, uh, we had a session, a uh, one-day session, which we, we were able to go through a lot of material, and it was quite, quite interesting to work in that fashion. Um, I think there is about 90 cameras all around us, but still there is that sense of, of, of no camera is really there because we would film this whole thing in post. Um, so we just we just capture the movements, and then we, as uh, me as a director, and and for the actors as well, we, we we're able to not think too much on on angles or where the camera is, but more on the performance. So somehow it it it's more it feels more similar to something like of of theater, and where you're a bit more free, um, and um, and then the the facial the facial gestures are are taken in by by these helmet cameras which then we use to, to track facial expressions, which then come in. And then when we, we get all this data inside of, of Unreal Engine, it is so much fun to see that whole world, the whole team has created. Um, and then, you know, we've been, we've been spending so much time making this world come together. And then suddenly when you, when you place these, these characters in there, there's something magical happening then. Working with Unreal Engine again, we can do it's it's so interesting from a creative standpoint to be able to place the actors in the level before the shots are even made. So then you know I would go in and, and tweak the camera, um, set up the lighting, even tweak some of the facial expressions, and it's it's just so much going on at the same time. Everything is tweakable. It is for sure <laughs> a potential time sink and a. Um, you could get lost in all this tinkering, but it's it's from a from a pure creative standpoint. This it's so much fun to be able to go in and and be totally free to like let's say if there's a lamppost in the background I need to change, if there is is a, a tree that needs scaling or I need to set dress or even uh, get a new shot or you get a new idea of of doing a, a shot in a different way. All of that is is possible because you have the the power of of Unreal Engine. Uh, with great motion capture and 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 characters, and it, I I think it's it's a very pleasant creative way to work, and um, which I'm sure a lot of a lot of creativity and and innovation will come from, both when it comes to editing, lighting, because you're you're free to really explore and, and experience throughout the whole process, really. For the, for the total experience of Snow, we, we want the player to be able to explore it. It is, a narrative. it is a narrative experience at its core, but still merging what you, you have from, from other games and gameplay and, and to make it a bit more playful. I and mean, you can actually run around freely in this town and explore. And it will start quite confined in the beginning, but it will open up as you play and you get new abilities. And you also have this this side of the game, which is Oscar is able to, to hack certain machines. And, and in this section of the game, 
it's much more like gameplay heavy and uh, and it's quite fun to see how that that blends into this more that gamey language blends in more with uh, the more cinematic language that we're, we're we know so well from from drama movies or scandinavian movies for to me it's very inspiring to be able to make games in this time and you see that that the language from movies and and language for games can be mixed in this way and that's a very interesting path to explore and you know making a game like this we're not that many and not that none of us has really released a game before but but still with all these tools and and the ability to to think new with all these t- tools you're, you're given it's uh there's no limits really for how much you you can do and how much you can exp- like innovate and uh, new processes and and uh yeah it's a really really exciting time to make games in so i hope that you liked what you saw thank you for watching and uh tune in for the, um, the 10 minute q a um, and i would love to answer some questions So that was Jonathan Nielsen of Loading talking about his game Last Days of Snow. And now we've got Jonathan on the line and we're going to go straight to a Zoom conversation. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for, uh, for presenting that to us. Uh, it's a really beautiful looking project. Um, and it's, uh, it's clear you've put a lot of, uh, there's a lot of care that's gone into uh, uh, crafting the world. And, and it, really, it really shows through in the footage that you're showing us. Um, so, and of course, as, a, as an actor, I love to see when uh, games people are, are really invested in using actors to their full potential in games. <laughs> um, I wanted Thank to you. ask you, oh, yeah, um, I wanted to start out asking you, uh, because it's clear that, that um, from the way you talk about it, that, that, that's, that that's really the, the part that you love is bringing that world to life. And, and you talk about the moment of freedom when you finally get to, to sort of all the elements come together and you can just explore and walk around and, and be there. Um, but you also talked about the sort of really long, possibly not so fun process of, of creating all the elements beforehand. I think you said it took possibly a year and a half before you really got to put it together. So um, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that and possibly um, find out if you have any advice for people, for creative people who, who want to work in this way and, and you know, are really, um, really inspired by and craving that, uh, that feeling of freedom that you get once you're inside of the beautifully realized world, but keeping track of everything uh, in the year and a half or however long it takes leading up to that and, um, and keeping focused on the goal when you're sort of having to build it one brick at a time. Yeah, well, there, there is, I think there's a lot of, uh, to unpack there, but uh, I think to, like as an advice to people uh, going, let's say the, the same path, I think would be, um, you know, it, it's a long journey. And then you, you, I think it's a, it really helps to have, let's say, define some sort of vision or at least have some sort of an idea um, from the get go. And that can be, I mean, something as simple as a, as a song or an experience or a moment in your life or something. And then you, know, you, you always kind of tap back into that when you're a bit uh, off path or, or when you find yourself a bit lost. And then you, you could just throughout the process, you, you add this and that grows into this, this vision of what, what this project really is. And I think that that is very, and for me, you know, it was very much coming back from, from my studies in England. And then I found myself for a month uh, in my, my parents' uh, house and where I grew up in, in uh, Norway in this uh, small town. And it was winter and then that that I was just struck by this nostalgia and that that kept me going. And I've always kind of cu- came back to that and then uh, this has been building that world so that that's been quite important i think and and also when you get others to work with you that you can communicate and try to portray this to to them mm. um but but I, but i think it's also it's also important to have some sort of fun in the construction of things you know even though i say it's it's a bit more dull it's it's very it's 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 a different sort of work i wouldn't say maybe it's boring it it shouldn't be boring i guess mm. it will be at times but i, I think it um, there are like these small pockets of, of magic uh, suddenly that, that happens, and I think that happens in both film and you know there is this this uh, tough work, but I think there there is this uh, in the construction process. 
I found um, that it really helps to, how would you put it? Um, to to do what, what really inspires you as well. Like yeah. suddenly for, for me it was like suddenly was this thing of getting the uh, photogrammetry in and getting uh, the actors to move and, and all these things. And then suddenly uh, next instant, if you were a bit bored, suddenly snow would be interesting to look at. And I think mm. everyone has this, these uh, these things that they are interested in, and and um, and you get a, a little bit of a boost when you're working on something that you are um, are really genuinely interested in. And when you when you are a small team such as ours, and you're making such a game, and there's there are so many things to pick from. So you, you, you there's always plenty of stuff to do. So it's actually quite fun to you can keep it fun by jump, jumping around and mm. and um, and being a bit free like that. So I think that is in important um really yeah. cool so so yeah so don't don't be too structured in your work process basically you keep keep following your inspiration so that it stays alive i mean you you have to have some structure of course yeah. to some extent but but i think there is and there is different stages right you start out if you i mean advice to those who actually start out and if you're alone i think that would be a good way of working of course now that we've been more and more structured there are other things that apply and now we're using you know scrum and we have daily catch-ups and meetings and stuff to make us keep, make sure we're on track. But, uh, but as a starting out advice, I think it's good to try to, to go towards what, what inspires you to keep you going uh, in those tough times. And, and then I think it's also, it's good if you're starting out making something from, from scratch. So I think it's, it's also good to be able to accept the bad things that mm -hmm. are included in that. So, so that you just accept that you, you probably will feel lost and, and that there will be highs and lows and you know that that those times won't be as such a discouraging when they occur because because they probably will at some point and and that's just a part of the process so yeah um yeah cool thank you um just you you mentioned it's a small team how many people are on the team um uh, now we are up to about nine to ten people working, um, more or less all of them full time, and and um, you know we've been a small team for for a very long time. In the last year, we've been so lucky to to get a bunch of talented people on board, and um, now we're working all together, and and it's uh, yeah, it's going great. It's fun, fun, fun process. Good. Um, do you have any advice for if somebody, you know, if somebody's watching this or they're, they're inspired by the, the, the way that you're working or they want to they wanna build a game um, that's focused on storytelling, they want to use motion capture, they want to use Unreal to, to create a, a, a beautifully crafted world. Um, do you have any advice for someone who, who might be approaching that for the first time and, and sort of what they should think about or keep in mind or, or, or how to scale um, their first efforts to, to you know, fit the the size of their uh, means, I guess. I think I think you know the the tools are all there now, and that's kind of the the what very interesting and exciting part. And then I guess it could also be a bit um, it could feel a bit too big, you know, because they like everything is there at your fingertips. So, but I, I think really it's just to to, uh, for example, in my case, or if it's something similar, it would be download Unreal Engine, and I think it's it's. Uh, really like online learning and Googling and all these things, mm -hmm. I think it are very, very useful skills, even in, in, uh, if you're doing uh, high end degrees, or I'm sure in like big AAA studios, you know, actually just going out and, and, and looking for content. Cause that's in itself a bit of a skill that I think mm -hmm. you can be become better at uh, effectively finding the information you're looking for, or find, uh, you know, looking through bits of code or, and uh, I think that is, really just, yeah, jumping into that and trying to solve a problem. Um, for me, I remember I did small tests of that was, you know, that I, I knew what I wanted to to try to figure out. For example, the the, the pipeline when it came to uh, making these uh, characters based on photogrammetry. Mm. And then it kind of drives you, but you know, there's just so many, um, you know, you got, it, it, it's it's a lot of tabs open on on your Google Chrome, and uh, yeah. <laughs> it's really just to get into it that way. I think I don't think there is any other way really. Mm. Um, since you mentioned the photogrammetry, I, I actually had a question. I wanted to ask you what made you um, what what drew you to uh, do three D scans of sort of uh, non celebrity actors um, because it's the sort of thing that obviously. Um, uh, 
if you if you have somebody whose face is recognizable, like if you want to put Mass Mickelson into you know a video game, then you you scan him so that people know that it's Mass Mickelson they're watching. But yeah. why? What 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 inspired you to take your um, your sort of non-famous actors and scan them into the game? Yeah, I mean, uh, but Stefan Corniard, which is playing in the game, and and uh, Christy Myers, they're they're both uh, kind of written, they've done lots of video games and AAA games and, and also um, TV shows and, and movies. So I would say they are um, absolutely, you know, they have a very good track record, but but mm -hmm. still going for these huge names. Um, I, I The most important thing for me is, is at least in this process, is to find someone that, that really fits the role. And, um, and we, we went through so many different uh, people and we, we, we looked through, yeah, I can't remember. I don't have a number, but many, many casting tapes. And the most important thing is that we go through a process where we find the, the actors and characters that really fits. Um, mm -hmm. fits those not really, you know, of course it would be nice if they, they are famous and can do good PR, but in the early beginnings of, of, a, of a process like that, it's, it's more in mind of, you have in mind more of the, um, yeah, that it's it's right for the story, really. I guess I meant more. Um, I wanted to know what, like, why why scan the actual actor as opposed to creating a, a custom character for uh, that you know that you just designed on your own, for instance. Yeah, so so I think it's it's easy to say that that's because of of uh, you want to portray their emotions or, or feelings, but then again, you know, you see Pixar or other games even or animations are. are are absolutely able to portray complex feelings and emotions. So, mm -hmm. or maybe even more effective. Uh, by it. But I, I think you know there is this this one thing is is this longing for for perfection, kind of, and, and for games to also grow as a medium and try to push the borders of what it is. And there is, uh, to me, it's very exciting this that it the visual language gets closer to that of film. So so you actually uh, can get even people that work in film or people that are um, you know, suddenly you could get, and there's so much competency and so much history of like this, uh, this uh, visual language and, and how you cut and how you edit and all this stuff that, that you actually could uh, mix with games. Um, and that I think fosters innovation, which is a, a very interesting place to be really. Mm -hmm. So it's, to be able to collaborate with, with kind of film industry people and different arts, uh, art departments and, uh, and to, to make something new. And, and I think there is, but it's when the more realistic something comes becomes, we tend to, I guess, uh, recognize as a bit more, let's say, adult or, or for, for more grown-ups. Um, I think there might be something in that too, maybe, um, mm. like a, a wish for for it to be kind of a game as a medium to be kind of uh, more as a. I don't think that games are at all for kids, but you know, there is this kind of notion for some people and. Uh, and that also is it's interesting to to be a part of. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a, a question from the audience here. Henrik asks, "How are you organizing the events in the game so that you make sure that the story is engaging for the player?" That's that's a that is a tough one. Uh, it is it's all about pacing, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. The the nice thing about uh, a game is that you can also allow the player to pace. Do the pacing a bit themselves. So with this open world, you know they're they're able to actually go straight to the next point of interest or where they need to need to go. Um, but they can also stop in in the local forest and and just explore, like get a bit of the the atmosphere there and uh, listen to the listen to the wind in the trees. Or you know they could do go and do a little side quest where they get a bit more of the the background story. Or maybe they can look. Um, if they find the book, you know, maybe they could read some some um, some background story and then get a bit more in like uh, depth of, of that background story. So so I think in in a video game you also have this this freedom for the player to to do a bit of the pacing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but on our end, you know, it, it's it's actually it's it's just a process. It's more like a, you just have to review, really. You have to make and then review what you've done. And, and what we're planning to do now for the rest of the game is really to try to mock up, uh, let's say, a very quick wireframe of, of how the events will turn out. And then we can easier and more quickly 
figure out how the pacing uh, is, let's say, in its, in its natural flow feels, mm -hmm. and then adjust thereafter. Cool. Um, and then another audience question, Adamir asks, what are the limitations with human photogrammetry scans in Unreal? Hmm, the limitations. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any limitations, to be honest. I mean, um, definitely one thing would be uh, the hardware you're running on. So you would probably go on PCs or PlayStation 5 and or I'm, I'm not sure if, if a mobile phones, at least if you're going with kind of 20 plus characters as we are. Um, but yeah, that's, that's like with all motion graphics, you know, there are hardware limitations, but in, in terms of uh, the photogrammetry process itself, I think there's more like, there's so many things happening right now. I, I'm not sure if you've seen um, thing of actually scanning um, all the facial, um, or making a mesh actually a photogrammetrized mesh out of the the actual performance. So so you get yeah, basically there's there's plenty going on, and I think there is just uh, sky's the limit for for photogrammetry in, in games and uh, and animation really. So okay. cool. Um, I think maybe we can squeeze one one last question. In. Um, Richard yep. Cooper asks how many how many artists did work on creating the hard surface models. Hard surface models. Hmm. It depends which hard surface surface models uh, he means. Uh, it is uh, as of artists we have had uh, I think about about four, no three in total that have worked on different sides. I think so. The the approach to to making such a game is that um, we make we make. Uh, from scratch, everything that is unique for the game. So for example, in this Norwegian town, everything that is Norwegian, very kind of, that sets the vibe of, of this um, this town, but everything that is generic, like let's say if there's a, it needs to be a Volvo there, there's no point. I don't think there is a point to go out and make a Volvo if you can go and buy one. Um, so then I think, and that's also how you would operate in film, right? Like, there's no need for to make every single chair around um, a dinner table. I mean, you could if they need to be important and they need to be special. But then that also allows you to to have some time to actually focus on creating those very important and, and unique parts. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, well, that was our last question. So I just want to say thank you very much for presenting The Last Days of Snow. Uh, and good luck uh, with the rest of the project. And thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a thank good you day. for having me. OK. You too. Okay. Good. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>
in your living room. In the early days when Edison and the Lumiere brothers invented moving pictures, moving pictures were all about flat content. Uh, today that's changing. Uh, all the computer power, the real-time render engines that are used for gaming, that we see in virtual and augmented reality, that we see in virtual studios, production sets, creating now big Hollywood releases, completely generated as 3D uh, virtual sets. This is bringing a new realm into content. Content is no longer created as flat images. It exists there out in the production world as true volumetric 3D images. So there's a need to be able to see that without every time having to put on some head-mounted display type. We all play in 3D, we all learn in 3D, and, and we all work in 3D, basically. You can't even think of a product today that hasn't been designed or constructed in 3D somehow. The irony is that we look at those 3D data on a 2D display. That, is, that really doesn't give us the whole experience. The tech industry is trying to, to make this better by allowing head-mounted displays to, to virtually augment 3D data into our environment. And that is really something and, and will provide benefits for sure. But how about the displays? I mean, we all interact with televisions and displays on a daily basis, and why should they keep being a 2D surface. Our vision is that those displays will become holographic as well, allowing the same apps, the same content from the head-mounted displays to come to life on these displays in full 3D and full perspective. That also allows a much more barrier-free collaboration between humans. It allows a multi-user experience around a display without having to bother yourself with any other technology. It's not like in VR where people are looking everywhere and over their shoulder. And in, when you have a holographic display, you have one direction, you have one point where people look at, but they still get this immersed feeling because they have all the dimensions and, and the full 3D. And that's not like, you know, the old 3D movies where, where when you move, the image follows you and there's no planes in perspective. No, 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 this is, this is full 3D, full perspective, looking around, seeing new uh, details behind every object. That's an immersive feeling, but still in a controlled manner where you know where people is looking. But just with that extra dimension, that extra feeling of looking into a reality. When you, when you perceive an image in an echo television, it comes out of the screen, but then you can walk around it and you can go up and down, see it from, from many angles. And every time you move your head around this object, you get an extra dimension. So you can say it's not only one dimension extra, like in normal 3D, it's multiple dimensions. We are not rendering an image perspective for each and every position in the room. We are creating a perspective for positions in the room where there is actually an eyeball to watch it. So we are tracking eyes in the audience. We are rendering perspective images only corresponding to those positions. And we're emitting light from the display only uh, towards those positions. That means a typical light field display may emit light in 50,000 or more directions for each frame. We emit light in, if you have five people watching the TV set, then the 10 eyeballs, so we will emit light in 10 directions. So that is several orders of magnitude, less bandwidth, less computing processing power, um, less complexity in the circuits. The huge advantage of the Echo technology is that it's low cost, mass manufacturable within the thin film production capabilities that we have today, which means it's not a, it's not a down the road future technology. It's something that can be produced now. Our ambition is to create a product that can be scaled up to mass production 
with the type of processes that are more or less in use today in existing display fabs. There is no reason to be confined to 2D television when we live in a three-dimensional world. The future is near, and it's definitely not flat. Uh, I love to go to the theater and see a real theater play. I want to get as close as possible to that if I'm sitting at home in my living room or are at the design office here in Royal Fiction. I want to get as close to that reality as possible because it makes me even better at what I do because I get a feeling of spaciousness. It's, it's about creating a technology that is really comfortable for people, uh, that is as close as possible to that real theater play. Um, that's what Project Echo is about. Let me ask, I mean, why, why are we several hundred thousand people working in this industry towards bringing these experiences to the verge of feeling completely real? I mean, it's down to the difference between looking at a roller coaster ride on a TV or looking at it through a pair of VR goggles. You feel that you are more there. It feels more real. Why do elder people uh, feel that they are brought back in time when they experience three-dimensional memories in, in virtual reality? Why can we cure people's phobies through these technologies? It's because we are so close to creating a perception of reality. That's why we will see a transformation into holographic visual communication over the next five to 10 years. Echo, holographic, television. So that was Real Fiction presenting their holographic television called Echo. And we have the team on the line now, and we're going to go straight to a conversation with them. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, it's a really fascinating, really cool looking piece of technology. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us tonight to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, jump right in. The first, the first question I had really was, um, how much, in the original conception of this and how you're thinking about it now, how much do you see it as a, a tool for work? So in terms of, um, you know, you, you talk a lot about 3D modeling, pre-visualization and the possibilities for it uh, in that field, those fields. Um, how much do you see it as a tool for work versus something that perhaps uh, might also have a place in the consumer market as an entertainment tool? Anybody wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead, Peter. Okay. Um, we see it as, as both, both yeah. entertainment and um, for work. Um, actually, uh, in the beginning, we were actually planning to do some kind of a more professional use uh, table-like uh, holographic display. Mm. But uh, going forward, we saw that, that uh, the only chance actually liberating, at putting this out at, at, at this uh, high level was to actually get the consumer market mm. on board. Otherwise, it would not be possible to, uh, to uh, deliver this kind of uh, deep technology uh, to the market. So we knew quite fast that we had to aim at the consumer market to, to get that leverage. Mm. Um, so actually, what we are bringing out in the end is a flat screen, like you see it today. So it's kind of one production line uh, going for both uh, uh, consumer and professional. Um, so, so we see it both for work and, uh, uh, and entertainment. So it could be in industrial design in terms of work. It could be architectural planning. Uh, it could just also be like uh, getting that extra dimension in, into, the, into the meetings. Uh, we, we, we strongly believe that, that um, 
uh, over the next 10 years, we will have a, 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 a huge wave of 3D content coming into the world. We will not only see it in computer games and, and uh, film production, you will also see it in, in PowerPoint. You already have access to show the 3D content in PowerPoint. Uh, uh, but also with with the with the weight coming with the mixed reality AR glasses, uh, a lot of uh, 3D content will be uh, produced, mm. um, and 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 therefore we see it in a split in a mix. Uh, so it's both uh, entertainment and uh, and work. Cool. So if, you, if you're someone who wants to watch their favorite movies at home, you can buy it as a television. And then if you're an interior designer and you want to have it as a tabletop tool, the way we saw in the video, you can, you can buy the same thing and use it either way. Is that correct? Exactly. And, and the most important thing is that most projects that have been running over the last 20, 25 years, trying to, to create these kind of stereoscopic uh, displays, I think most of the times why they have failed is that also because that the technology have not been ready. It have uh, been too exotic. Uh, the components around it, both in photonics and film uh, technology have not been there. Um, what we see today is that that the what was exotic like 10 years ago is really like we are there now. We are we are very close to to we can see that. This can be this can be actually be done now, uh, and that's a new thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so um, yeah, hmm. yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, well, I think you've certainly gotten people's interest because the next two we have two questions from the audience. The first of which is when can I buy it, and the second one is what will it cost. Uh, thing. <laughs> um. When can you buy it? I don't have an answer to that. Sorry, <laughs> we are we had an R and D phase um, that uh, at some point it's definitely the plan to bring on board uh, an industrial partner and uh, accelerate a path towards the market. Uh, maybe Class could uh, expand a little on these thoughts. Yeah, I'd be happy to do so. So, so basically, the time to market is decided by the the big display makers, right? Because they have the, the, the capacity and the technology to speed this up. Um, so it's not going to be, you know, this Christmas and, and probably not the next Christmas either. But, but uh, thereafter, we should uh, not be too long away. Cool. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you the... Um, the in the video, you have people playing video games using using hand motions. Is that um, is that uh, being able to control games with hand motions? Is that um, part of the current uh, technology that you're developing, or is that more of a concept for future use? I would say uh, that 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 would be a normal part of uh, of this television, mm -hmm. uh, also being built into the into the into the flat screen. Mm -hmm. uh, because basically, what we do is that that we create a computer vision device in in the in the in the screen that looks into the room and actually catches people's eyeball. So we are tracking with very low latency um, uh, the position of people's eyeballs. That's mm. very precise, even on five meter distance from the television. And we we can we 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 are aiming at tracking up to ten eyeballs at the same time. So. So bringing out these holographic images to five people at the same time in the room. So, so that kind of tracking that we're working with uh, to, to, to want to put into this technology is really fast. Um, and and uh, we don't see any uh, problem uh, uh, even creating haptic touch uh, with this. But at, at, uh, also, of course, as we have been seeing it on the Xbox and PlayStation, uh, and other uh, concepts that uh, people can play with their hands, they can put their, their body into the into the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, what you see there in 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 the uh, in the video, um, we're certainly aiming for that. Yeah, I can add to that that um, haptics and gesture tracking is already existing technologies. Uh, they will for sure develop further. 
Uh, this is not a focus of our R&D here, but as these already exist and will be developed further by other parties, it would be natural that this would be combined with our technology at some point in time. But our focus is to create the holoscopic, the holographic experience from the screen. That's our hardcore focus with this. But you know, it's a natural that, you know, sound of course, and other uh, sensory elements, haptics and uh, uh, other effects will of course be able to be combined with our technology. But, but our strong focus is on the visual experience and deliver something that is more realistic than uh, you have seen before in a flat screen medium. Cool. Um, Henrik asks, how can storytellers like filmmakers use the echo to tell new forms of stories? Yeah, yeah that's a very good question. Um, I think there's also been already some um, sessions in this um, symposium here about um, new types of content generation and uh, virtual sets. And that's definitely a piece of the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, content is being more and more produced and generated in 3D. Images are not longer created or conceived um, in the mind of the authors as flat images, but really as 3D imagery. So that creates a wealth of uh, 3D content that we would be able to tap into uh, when this really revolutionizes the, uh, the, industry, the production pipeline and industry, which is already uh, happening right now. I just, I just want to add, add a thing. <laughs> and that's, yes. uh, that's um, uh, you can say the, the, the echo technology uh, brings out uh, the best of, of all the worlds in 3D. So, so imagine that you have a, a flat screen in, in your living room where you can watch all the, the back catalog of 3D stereoscopic films. Mm. So you, you can enjoy that in 3D without use of glasses. Mm. And then you have the other category that is holographic. Mm. That's something different. That's something new that you can you can bring out pictures from the screen. You can freeze it, walk around it, going up and down. That's holographic. Mm. That's the, the same content that you're going to bring out in AR glasses when mm. when eventually Apple Glass come out or, or Facebook. Um, um, but but uh, but that's the, the the echo technology brings out the best uh, the best of both worlds. So you can actually uh, watch all the old movies uh, that is done in stereo uh, and then also uh, enjoy this new holographic medium. And, and personally, I, th I think, uh, of course, holographic media, the people are working around. There is several companies around in California that is setting up uh, virtual stages now to be able to shoot 360 uh, shots, full uh, avatars of uh, human actors people mm. um, and we will see that uh, distribution of holographic content we also imagine that that uh, streaming services like HBO and Netflix will be able to stream content like this because it's easier to bring it live mm. than record it mm. because it's a stream if you open up like 15 uh, YouTube channels at the same time on, on your computer it, it's it's not a problem you can do that now today on, on even not, not a fast computer because everything is calculated in the cloud. Mm. So, so we imagine, for example, uh, window channels. Uh, it sounds strange, but, but uh, imagine that you have a, a channel that brings out windows to the, real, to, to the world, uh, like uh, 5,000 locations. Mm. It's, it's generated in 3D, mm. but it's, it, it could be photorealistic uh, worlds created in Unreal eventually. Mm. Uh, going for, uh, for example, in a jungle, uh, you go to the jungle, a kid goes to the screen and says, I want to see a tiger. Mm. And, and the tiger jumps into the living room from, from this jungle, mm. which is photorealistic. Mm. Then they, they, she go for another uh, animal and, and another animal comes out. Um, so she can talk to the screen and the screen brings out these uh, features that she can study together with her father and mother. And the... Uh, be more emerging. Uh, you can say it could also be like a theater play, mm -hmm. where where 
it's more like a theater play, maybe like mm-hmm. a very advanced, super advanced puppet theater play, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, where it's one frame. Uh, it's not cutting all the time, fast cutting, because you get all that data. You have that all the data because you can move around, you can go closer to the actor, you can be standing there together with the actors in a scene, mm. but maybe you don't need to have those all those cuts. The difference here is that it's not VR, so you, you don't look around, uh, you don't uh, lose your audience. The audience is in this direction, in, in a frame, mm. in the television, but it's, 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 uh, it's uh, deep, and it comes out, and you can you can pick up all that data from that scene. It mm. will be something different. It's mm. something different to enjoy. Mm. Uh, and I hope that we will see new, totally new formats in this mm. way. So interesting, really cool. Um, and and so when you're talking about um, the, all this content, is it? Um, does it need to be adapted in some way to be able to play on the television? Or can you just, you know, you're talking about streaming from HBO, for instance. Um, could you just Chromecast something straight onto your uh, television and, and, and uh, onto your Echo and it's going to come straight off the HBO? Or is, is HBO going to have to have like a special, uh, a special channel for this type of content? Or if you want to play a video game on it, can you just plug your Xbox straight in? Or do you need a, yeah, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, from a technical perspective, there are different scenarios. Uh, of course, uh, you want a flat screen to be able to be backwards compatible, so you can see existing TV shows and uh, movies and everything. So backwards compatibility is one thing. Then you want, if you want to leverage the effect, um, the fascination that this new type of display uh, can produce to the viewer, then you would need to accommodate that in the content creation. From I think from a very early point in conception of your dramatic idea, you know where are the thrills and where are the highlights and where are we actually using this new fascination power actively and uh, there will also probably be a phase learning phase for content producers to use it and dose it right, not uh, overuse it like in the old days when stereo arrived, you would have very extreme stereo, one instrument playing in one loudspeaker and another instrument playing in the other. Um, but, but there would be some adaptation. Um, one level is, as Peter mentioned, just showing also back catalogs of stereoscopic 3D movies. But where it really will shine is that when you have 3D holographic or, or light field 3D uh, real content, and that could very well be uh, to the gaming world because everything is already existing there right on your console in 3D and um, being compatible with gaming consoles is, is a big focus on mm. our development mm. efforts here. Mm. That kind of, it kind of goes to, into our, um, our next question, uh, sort of related from Matthias, is how will the content for this be produced and who will be creating it? Um, and I guess I'll throw onto that too, if, if people need to be thinking Thinking of the echo when they're creating their content, um, yeah, how uh, how are you uh, sort of encouraging people to do that? Yeah, I think people would need to be thinking of all the new devices that are capable of delivering this holographic effect, mm-hmm. uh, and all as Peter mentioned, the glasses, which will be a big thing in the com- coming years. We surely believe so, will be a big driver for this type of content. Mm. And um, this would basically be a formatted version of content that could be created for glasses. For example, a a gaming experience created for XR glasses that Mm. could be, you know, a mode you select that is a holographic display mode. That's that's basically a format version of this type of content. Mm Um, our next question from Kim is, did you build your own tracking software? Huh. Um, yes and no. We did, uh, but mainly to make a very initial proof of concept and to be able to carry on with our first experiments. Um, but there are a lot of good people working very good and hard at getting eye tracking, and eyeball tracking, observer tracking. 
uh, very, very good and effective. Uh, it's even coming into uh, smartphones today, LiDAR based, stereo camera based, um, point cloud infrared based systems. So our strategy is that um, we will surf that wave and not develop our own, but uh, basically take advantage of this. This will be a commodity thing to get good eye tracking within a few years. We may need to have some special adaptation of it at some point in time. We need to have it very low latency, but we can also see that this is this is arriving mm. on the technology scene. So, so our bet is to, to leverage upon others. Great yeah. efforts in this area. Cool. And I was curious: is there? A, oh, sorry, go on. I go on. just to add that to Fastin's um, um, that that. You can say our focus had been uh, all the way uh, through the project, the pixel technology. Uh, that's where we are going to deliver. Um, and that all the, all the components that is down the shelf and that is advancing very fast at the moment, also kind of high, high uh, low latency tracking. Um, uh, we have been mostly focused on, on uh, developing this uh, unique pixel technology that enables the whole thing uh, in the end. So that is our main focus uh, also at the moment. Cool. Okay. So you're basically you're, you're, you're pulling together innovation that's going on in other aspects of the industry. And then, and then this is your focus on adding this one new uh, aspect to it and, and kind yeah. of combining them in a new way. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, we have a question. Henrik has a question for Klaus. You mentioned some good examples of use with a purpose like um, elderly with phobias. Uh, or elderly people and, and phobias. Um, do you have other ideas for how to use the echo for new ways, uh, new, new methods of more impactful communication? Yeah, so, so I, for example, um, would love to be able to design and create objects in full 3D without having to wear headsets. Mm. So, so I know that's, that's in many industries, a big thing also in ours that we design and create products, uh, uh, you know, objects, whatever, in 3D, but we're still limited to, to seeing it on a 2D screen. That means before we actually put things in production, we always need to go through these several rounds of having to create prototypes and, and maybe 3D print things to see it in, in, in all perspectives and also see it in relation to maybe other items and stuff. So we can we can fast forward and, and, and sort of remove all those obstacles when the real-time 3D data that we work on is being perceived in full 3D and can be seen in relation to other objects. So, so that for me professionally is one thing that I really look forward to and that can save us as one example, a lot of work. One use case I could also add is um super realistic telepresence where uh, several people in one room in one location and a group of people in another location can actually have a real feeling of presence and getting individual eye contact between different yeah. parties. This is something that is only possible if you have a directional display where one viewer is seeing one image and another, another viewer is seeing another image so that you can actually create individual eye contacts as if you were sitting around the same table. It's another use, one of my own preferred use cases. <laughs> so does that mean, just to jump in, sorry, it, it, does that mean that if you were having, you could be having a meeting with someone and if it's one person talking to a group of five people, all those five people might feel that that one person is making eye contact with them individually? Um, um, to, to, uh, to, what I'm thinking about is that if you, for example, have three people sitting in a meeting room in Los Angeles and three people sitting in another meeting room in Copenhagen. Mm. Uh, one person from Copenhagen can make eye contact with a specific person in Los Angeles mm. and they will both know that now they have eye contact and the other persons will know that uh, these two have eye contact and other persons could simultaneously, for example, establish eye contact between them. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Um, Johannes asks, what are the main technical challenges that you still have to overcome? 
Oh yes, um, uh, we are very much. We have created a first proof of concept of a pixel. It's a scale model. Uh, so our two focus areas now is to create it in true size or uh, close to true size of a 65 inch uh, television and uh, making sure that everything we do is as compatible as possible with uh, industrial processes. Mm. So um, being making the, the thing ready for mass production. I mean, there are some nice demonstrators out there of light field displays that uh, are pretty impressive, um, but they are very expensive and they do not lend themselves easily to mass production. Mm. So getting the pixel size small enough and getting it ready for mass production. In, in broad terms, that's the major focus areas not right now. And this involves a lot of uh, development in uh, both optics and electronics and then film electronics. Mm. And as I mentioned before, software is not our focus right now for eye tracking and all that. So mm. that will be later. Mm. Uh, and then I think that sort of leads a little bit into our, our last audience question here. Kim wants to know if you're working towards making an echo that's uh, uh, for tablets, basically. Uh, we have that as a use case. Um, so basically the technology is a pixel technology, right? So it could work with any kind of display. But we also have a belief that um, these kind of holographic images, what they really deserve is a big screen. Mm. And the stereoscopic and holographic experience really shines when, when you have a big field of view that fills out a large fraction of your field, field of view. So you don't sense the frame too much, as with every as with every three D experience. If the frame, uh, if you are very much uh, aware of a small frame in your central field of vision, it kind of counteracts uh, the holographic experience of really being there and having the um, the three dimensional space as, as surrounding you, diving into. So therefore, our Focus is to be able to make it big, also because this is what <laughs> has not yet been achieved, really, uh, to make a really big light field or holographic displays. So this is a major achievement that, that we want to prove. But basically, it is a pixel technology, so um, it could work with different sizes of displays. As, as Dean said, um, we, are, we are looking into, uh, as a use case, uh, tablet the tablet market also. But our main focus is the large, large format displays. Yeah. But cool. the, the tablets is on the mind. It's future future thoughts then, yeah. Mm. Um, so one, uh, one, one quick last question. Uh, if anybody here in, is there, is there a way for people to, to see this in, in action in real life at the moment? I know obviously it would probably be a prototype or something, but do you have a, a working version in, in Denmark here that people can see? We have our first proof of concept, which is actually basically just a very small bunch of pixels. So it's not a display. Mm -hmm. uh, it would only be impressive to professionals in pixel technology. <laughs> yeah. uh, it doesn't deliver a complete image or anything. Mm -hmm. So that will have to wait. That's a little bit into the future. But we're working hard on making that happen and looking forward very much to that. <laughs> But the magical part here that has been created is really the ability to, to direct the light precisely enough to hit each eye, to mm -hmm. direct different uh, differentiated light to different people, mm -hmm. and to do that by sub-addressing subparts of pixels. And that we can demonstrate, and that's truly magical. Yes. And with the technology that is, uh, has the potential of uh, scaling up to mass production. Exactly. Designed for mass production at low cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steen, Klaas, and Peter, for joining us and for presenting uh, the Echo TV. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank You're you. welcome. Thanks Thank for you. participating. Take care. Bye now. Take care. <laughs> wait, wait, leave that there for a second. Can you put it under the thing just a little bit? Yeah. 
Yep. So that was Steen Iverson, Klaus Durholm, and Peter Simonson from Real Fiction talking to us about the Echo TV. Now our next guest is Romain Bozex from Spline, and he's going to talk about motion control, live viz, and virtual production in France. Hello everyone, my name is Romain Bozex. Uh, I'm CEO of Spline uh, Visual Engineering. We are based in Paris, in France, and uh, we would like to speak about motion control and virtual production today through this uh, video. In the first part, I will speak about uh, who we are and what we do and why we do that. Um, about uh, several technologies we use to use on set and uh, how we do that. We have some making of to show you. And uh, then um, I will uh, go through different subjects about motion control and uh, how um, we use this technology, we, we, what kind of uh, workflow and uh, what kind of um, techniques uh, could be additional to the motion control and to find creative ways to use it um, in, um, in good creative ways. And in the third part I will go through virtual production, uh, which is a very wide subject, but uh, I will speak about just a very general introduction of it. Uh, then I will move on um, the, the different tools and um, and workflows it requires. We have been working the last six months on some proof of concept, and uh, we will have some feedbacks to give to you on that. So I'm going to show you our little tutorial, and uh, then I will explain my little background. So it was uh, our uh, last um, last year demo reel. I hope you enjoyed it. How uh, that um, it will be updated uh, next month. I'm working in the VFX industry for around ten years, and I founded the DC, the, which is um, a three D and VFX studio in two thousand thirteen. I acquired my visual effects knowledge on more than fifty short films and video clips where I understood the importance of anticipation in creating CG imagery. I understood that less budget there is, the less VFX are funk before the shooting. After working on long length films and TV commercial, I wanted to give the opportunity to little projects to have good visual effects. So I thought that onset tools could be a good help to integrate visual effect teams and add production value thanks to the good workflow. But I needed some good tools and a visionary crew members. 
So three years ago, Spline was born. I built my team step by step, and now we are six people working every day plus several interns. After some financial exercise, we acquired those toys for a good start. We have a studio of 300 square meter inside Paris, the motion control called Jarvis, and a, a Phantom Veo 4K that uh, can help us on tabletops and high speed shots. On the side, we developed the software to be able to control the robotic arms precisely. Around the tools, we have set up several services that make the tools work perfectly. For every project, we study the best way and technologies available to make it possible in the budget the production has for it. Spline develops and provides systems, solutions and mancraft for the constant evolving needs of video production. Technology is becoming more and more powerful and accessible, so let's use it in our creative and money checky world. This evolution enables us to democratize technologies at minimum cost. We have two robotic arms in-house for different kinds of shots and use. You might know the motion control that looks like cranes, but we are not in this game. We prefer to be fast and agile on set. Robotic arms does not need calibration of EV setups. This is why you can bring down the cost of such services. It still remains a budget, but the production value you gain worth it. Here is a little timeline and list of techniques that helps to the use of motion control. Test shot gives us the ability to see how things move and happen in movement. Motion control preparation allows the team to think without onset stress what the setup will look like. The previs is a well-known technique that gives the creative crew an idea of what the shot will look like. In a motion control workflow, it is useful to see how the effect will work. The techviz on the side of the previs gives the technical crew the specifications and dimension they need to know for the D-Day setup. High speed is more a capacity that offers robot arms in front of the motion control cranes. The triggering is a synchronization of different tools on set, which is a good help when things are fast or have to be repeated a lot of time. And of course, the visual effect supervision, which is the key from the beginning of the project that needs some magic in the frame. The range of effects offered by the use of motion control in native production is quite wide. It can be complex camera moves, complex shots to synchronize specific type of chronology shots, action sequences, duplications of actors, etc. For commercials, robot arms are used for the same effects it offers in narratives, but more often around the product. Coupled with high speed, you can obtain magical instant in frame. Production managers call us as well when they have too, too much shots with camera movement to record in one day, even if there is no effect. The repeatability and precision it offers allow teams to move on fast. When we started Spline, a use of motion control that we did not imagine was the events. It is used mostly for what it is than what it can do. So we have set our Jarvis on stage, dancing with artists and in famous cinema ceremonies. So that's all for robots, let's move in the new world of virtual production. In introduction, I would say that technologies and workflow behind it are moving pretty fast. 
We will all agree that it is a new era of filmmaking, but at what cost? Because if Hollywood can afford it, does indie films can have a chance to try it as well. To make everyone on the same page, virtual production is not a new tool. It is a workflow that has been used for a while in blockbuster productions, but without naming it. In 2009, James Cameron introduced the subject to the industry with the production of Avatar, changing the order of some production steps. In 2020, John Favreau popularized the term in producing The Mandalorian in late world stages. Unreal released a very interesting white book on the subject you can find on their website. On our side, at Spline, like other tech companies, we did a proof of concept to try to understand the opportunity of late world stages. It is called Hollywood Now, directed by James F. Cotton. Here is a little uh, part of it, you can find it on our Vimeo. Let all stages rise up around the globe in the last six months. The bad news is, currently, you can shoot in a virtual stage for 20k euros to 50k euros a day of shooting. And that is just the price of the studio, which is kind of complicated to argue for most of the producers. The good news is, like everything, new stuff is always expensive. So let's hope that with the spread of the use and the competition, the cost could get down. The other good news is on the 3D virtual side. When you create something in 3D, it can be reused without limits and that is, like any kind of data, the gold of this era. So today we are in a beta step for this new process, still expensive and not optimized in quality. But then with, the, with more people using and improving it, the cost might start to drop in the next two years. So be patient. Keep your stories warm, they will be alive soon. Let's get back at Spline. We worked on the real-time 3D for some time. When the lead wall started to appear, we wanted to be in. But not on the equipment part, on the workflow side, the dark side of the lead wall stage shootings. So we launched our proof of concept called Reboot Now to understand with what we were dealing with. Here is a little workflow we set up and adjusted after learning during the production of this short film. The virtual production needs more creativity before the shooting, and that is the most important thing everyone needs to understand. If you like to go on set like Terence Malik, for example, feeling the wind and smell the location to be inspired, you might not like this kind of prep. On the other side, if you like to control precisely the art direction and want to free your camera on set, this is definitely the good tool. The best advice I can give you when writing your story is do not think how you can achieve it and if it's possible. Do not constrain your creativity to match the use of a specific tool. Let producer and technician do it for you. The use of lead wall stages has to be think like one of the solutions for a sequence, not for an entire project. Of course, it depends on what kind of content you shoot, but the percentage of use of LED walls compared to the use of usual studio sets will vary for every project. 
I mean, it is not because the Steadicam exists that the tripod is not useful. It is complementary. Speaking of tool, here is two other things we developed in-house at Spline and complete the LED wall stages. Motion control giving its position to video game engine with green screen and you obtain real-time compositing without latency. And at last, here is the little new one called Flynn, which enables you to track any camera wireless wherever you shoot. Here's the demo. To be complete on virtual stage, I'm gonna show you the behind the scene reboot now. I want to thanks all the team and companies, Holocene Studio, Decid, Plateau Virtuel, and the makers who helped us to raise this project successfully. Here we go. Virtual production is, in my opinion, a new kind of filmmaking. How to make a movie with less budget as possible and with more creative possibilities as possible in the same time. This is virtual production. Spline is a visual engineering company. We are specialized in uh, technologies that enable unseen images for uh, advertisements and also for fictional narratives. Plato Virtual is a solution for cinema professionals to use Unreal Engine to project 3D scene in real time and to be tracked by a physical camera to add the parallax. So it's run by LED wall with a pitch of 2.5 mm with controller on the back. Everything is run uh, with Unreal Engine. Real-time 3D is entering the cinema world. The LED volume is a place where you can have background and the light completely linked. The actors and foreground melt with the background. It's not like green screen where you don't know what will happen in post-production. For me, one of the things I really discovered when I was making the plan was that now it's easy to shoot everything chronological. Because you can just move this, flip this, boom. Lighting is super easy, super fast. You can change a lot of things, even everything, during the prep. On set, you can fine-tune what has been done in the prep. Plus tu rajoutes des éléments de déco, plus tu crées des layers, des calques, en fait. Et là, à un moment, ton cerveau, il ne sait plus. I mean, it's really like, take the time in the, both in development and pre-production. Really think about in development, why do you want to use the screen and what does it work for? Une nouvelle étape apparaît en pré-production, euh, c'est la création des environnements, des assets et des animations en temps réel. Créer les différents décors euh, en amont, en coordination avec le réalisateur, le directeur de la photo, la production. 
Une fois sur le plateau, les décors sont faits à 99%, c'est plus de, de l'affinage. La pré-production permet aux chefs de poste de nouvelles possibilités de création. Ils doivent se projeter, mais différemment. Les clients et les producteurs peuvent mieux maîtriser tout ce qui sera filmé. Ça permet d'éviter les mauvaises surprises. Il y a moins de limites à la créativité. Donc on bride moins les équipes face aux contraintes habituelles de planning et ou financières. Plus de problèmes météo, plus d'imprévus, et ça... Là où ça rend le mieux, c'est quand on a une partie des décors, on a du la vraie déco qui se combine avec la déco 3D, et on a des vraies lumières qui se combinent avec les lumières 3D. Et c'est là que c'est les reflets du décor virtuel sur la déco réelle, sur tout ce qui est métallique, tout ce qui va réfléchir. Il bah, y a un gros potentiel de synergie entre le, le réel et le virtuel. Il y a un truc qui est cool, on est en train de créer de la connaissance dans l'audiovisuel. The sky is the limit, actually, it's, uh, it's a bit crazy. To finish this presentation, I would say that, like for every project of any size, the good balance has to be defined by both creatives and producers with the help of specialists. Tools allow to solve the balance, and sometimes the good tools are not the ones we first think of. Ask for technicians. They might have an idea that can help on your project. Thank you for watching. I hope I could give you some highlights on those takes and workflows. Uh, do not hesitate if you have uh, any question following the Vizard conference. It would be a pleasure to answer. Thank you very much. Bye. So that was Romain Bozix from Spline in France talking about motion control and virtual production. And we have Romain on the line now. Hello, Romain. Welcome. Hello. How are you? Good. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the, the presentation and for showing us everything that you're working on over there in France. Um, it's welcome. a lot of really, really interesting, very cool looking stuff going on. Thank um, you. I wanted to ask you uh, to start out talk, talking about the, uh, the motion control cameras. Can you tell us how much of, um, how much of the cameras and the, the rigs and, and software and things that you're using are, are custom? How much of it did you develop for your own, own studio and, and how did you get there? So um, the fact is uh, we, we bring stuff that already exists, like the robot, we did not build it. Uh, it's uh, industrial stuff. And um, we, we com complete it with a lot of things. We look for like state of the art from everywhere, every kind of industry. Then, uh, we find solutions to make it for the audiovisual industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, like for the motion control, it was uh, mostly for the plate camera and, and um, the pedestal that we, we crafted from scratch. But mm -hmm. then for the software part, we, we built several uh, layers of software to make it uh, possible to control like in Blender. Mm -hmm. We, right now, um, uh, directors built their own paths of camera and they said it to us like and we checked if it's uh, okay and the robot can do it mm -hmm. it's pretty fast so this is on the motion control part and for the live is because it's all our in our stuff and it's the same it's uh we looked for uh, different kind of uh, very small devices and um and we stitched them together to to have what we were looking for Mm -hmm. And we developed a lot of software as well. Yeah, cool. Thanks. And um, the uh, so the, the robot arm. I'm a bit curious about that. You say it's an industrial one. Is it um, is it from a uh, what 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 was its original purpose or or how did you how did you find that one and choose to use it and, oh, and where did we, it come from? In fact, um, this one is from a, a KUKA. It's a German uh, German and China Chinese company. Uh, that uh, built uh, manufacturer robots, and um, the, um, we we did a, a, a benchmark of what kind of robot would be um, would be good for our use. And mm. uh, because in England there is um, a Mark Robert motion control, which is uh, the the most known uh, company that's built and use uh, motion control, and um, but. The, the the software they 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 had was a big a bit um, 
uh, old, old fashioned mm. style. And we didn't like big stuff to be big stuff. It's, it's, we, we like flexibility and mm. we like to be agile without big cranes and big stuff. It's just mm. motion control we have uh, is still big, but it's on, on wheels and you can change it of place very fastly. So we were looking for a small robot that still big can have a big range of motion, but mm. you can one person can move it easily. Mm. Okay, cool. And um, how, uh, where did you get the idea for, for starting this company? What was your inspiration? What, what made you say, I want to, uh, I want to start a company that, that's working with motion control cameras? Um, the, the, at the very beginning, it's because because of my background when I when I built my first company called DCD, um, I worked a lot in post production and sometimes on set, mm -hmm. and I I spend a lot of time to struggle uh, with um, with everyone who is on set and not with us behind the computers to say, yeah, it was important to have trackers on set, you know, and mm. or a good uh, light and a green screen or stuff. Simple for us, but very complicated to understand on set. Mm. And um, I I had a problem with the workflows. And, and the thing is, when you say workflow in, in filmmaking uh, size industry, it's, it's, it sounds weird say workflow it because it looks like industrial it's not good good sound for for us and uh when you say workflow you are thinking of hollywood and big companies and stuff like that and what i wanted to do is to think a sorry to think about a solution that where we can um bring something on set to be present when most of the problems will come in post-production mm. to be here and to force to have some preparation about the VFX because motion control is when you have specific specific effects to do. And so the motion control was a workflow and it was a big toy. And big toys, on-set guys, they love big toys and they respect the one who are controlling it. And this is very, very important for us because when I was on set, I used to be on set like VF, as VFX supervisor. And and when you say something, yeah, it uh, okay, doesn't matter. You will see it on, on in post production, and you say to the producer, yeah, I will see it in post production, and you will see it uh, in the bill. And they say, ah, okay, that it's always complicated to discuss. Mm. But here with the motion control, then we say, yeah, we must take some time to think of this motion and everything, even the DP say, okay, that's a mm. good idea. I, I wouldn't be able to say that with, without motion control. Mm. So this is very specific because you don't need motion control for everything, but it was the first idea. And mm. then, so I started with the, with the motion control like that. And maybe also because ILM or Zemil started as motion control companies, I will I think mm. that it might be a good lead I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask. I have, this is uh, because I'm not a technical person. I was just curious watching the video. Um, when you are planning a shoot and you want the the camera to track, you know, water falling down, or you want it to, you know, f perfectly follow the contours of a motorcycle, how do you how do you tell the camera to do that? Like, how do you Obviously, you, I, I, there must be some. Are, are you calculating the sort of physics of how fast the water is falling, and then telling the camera to move at the same time, or is it is it following the object, or how does it know that it's yeah? How, how does that all work? Um, it's pretty simple. In fact, uh, we we designed it to be simple. Um, mm. The first way when you have when we have something that we don't know how it can to to be. We think of the fastest way to control the robots is mm -hmm. the it's a six axis mouse mm -hmm. where you can control the position and you put uh, points uh, a and b and you say okay it will be fast 10 percent you test okay it's not 10 percent so more 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 and then you you find um the good speed so mm. this is for simple moves mm. if you are looking for 
very um, complex, more complex. Um, and if you have time in prep, or in, in prep, so we do it in Blender because we developed the plug a plugin in it to to have the robot, and you have a, a very simple rig of the robot, and you can control it very easily. And and the robots uh, tell you in Blender if it's it, he can do it or not. So you can with a little previs and everyone can do it um, mostly on, on Blender because it's famous in filmmaking and it's in Cinema 4D as well. Uh, so they, they send us uh, FBX, some very um, simple file, 3D files, and then we just tell them, okay, it's, it's okay, it looks great, let's shoot. So, and we, we, we thought that uh, Workflow is important, but flexibility for the creativity is, is more important as well. Hmm. So there's kind of a, each time there's a bit of a problem solving process and just sort of working through with whatever the, the object is that you're shooting to make sure that it, it works right. Yeah, yeah, yeah completely. It's, um, we, we, we cannot, um, cannot track the robot is not because it's still industrial and for hmm. very, for security um, subject, we, we cannot, um, we cannot uh, plug it with um, AI. We cannot mm. do it because mm. um, when the robot moves, we we asked it to to move. It's not we don't know how it will move. <laughs> uh, so we we needed a very um, very good tools to, to control it, mm. and and it will not uh, it will never be able to track someone mm. um, like you don't know if someone moves it, it, it won't be able to to track it it's not it's, it's impossible for this kind of robots yeah. okay cool thank you um, we have a uh, question from the audience here uh, Matthias asks have you noticed any issues or challenges with depth or perspective um, no uh, in fact um, we, we it's depend of, of the um, of the shot obviously but uh, we have um, the synchronization with the with the with the focus, so you can you can have the precise focus. Uh, if you know the distance, then it's aut automatically controlled. Uh, and about depth, I don't understand the question about sync to the motion control, but. I think it was just about yeah with, with using the camera on a on a motion control rig. If there were any issues with with yeah the way that the the camera. Does what mm. cameras do? I think that was the yeah. You can plug any camera on it, and uh, and we 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 can, we plug it with the with the robot to to sync it, but mm. then you can do whatever you want mm. with any cool. camera. Cool. Thank you. Um, Henrik asks, which mistakes should one avoid when using the LED walls, and what advice <laughs> would you give Danish filmmakers who are curious to work with these new possibilities? Where should they start? That's a big question. <laughs> uh, I think um, the first thing is to to see uh, what kind of lead walls are available around you, and to start the discussion directly with them. Because mm. uh, if you have uh, if you have a, a story to tell, um, you you must you must see with what you want to, to to tell it if you want to tell it with lead walls then you might it's a big deal so you must uh, find a solution before you complete you complete your your story if you don't know then as i was saying in the video you just let it on the side and see what's happening with tech and if you see something that could be a good idea for your story then go for it mm. And and for LED walls, yeah, you, you it's um it it will it will be easier to understand in in several months because everyone is going in any direction with it, and uh, I think very good idea might comes up, and we definitely need to follow those uh, those guys. Mm. And were there were there any mistakes that you would avoid when uh, when approaching using LED walls? Um, 
yeah the, the size of it the size mm. of the of, of the of the stage is is quite important because because of the pitch you know the the distance between legs and and um, it was uh, and a bit uh, problems we could avoid because we had a director who could switch of of um, idea very fastly and was very creative on the set is that we had uh, um, we had we had prepared a lot of 3D scenes for the environment and uh, like we didn't know what to expect on set because we couldn't try it before. Uh, we 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 prepared a lot of scenes and then on set when one was working everyone was happy and then we 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 could shoot but when one was crashing we say okay let's move to an, uh, another one and uh, our first AD was he's Danish and uh, he was just crazy about that because uh, in France it was a kind of a mess on the set and. Mm -hmm. uh, and and for that the, the the director was very very um creative on that he could he could switch very very fastly because real time freedom is is awesome but you have to be very very prepared uh mm. that it can crash easily yeah okay cool thank you uh we have one last question this is from andre in the audience what is the Flynn Tracker? Where can I purchase it? Is it affordable? And what differentiates it? Um, so you, you cannot buy it right now because it's still in beta. Mm. <laughs> and uh, but in, in I would say in one year, it will be completely, um, completely uh, buyable. You can you can we, we, we do not hesitate to send us a mail. We will write your uh, newsletter about that. Um, it's um, it will be uh, uh, affordable. The, we designed it for that, and mm. and we designed it to be uh, plug and play for filmmakers. It's it's the complete idea because um, some solutions already exist on the market, but they are not affordable at all. Because um, it's like when you have um, a new tool, it has to be expensive because it's new, and and then the cost get down, but some of the of the players on the market want to play big and and this is not us it's like motion control if you want a big motion control you can do it but you would you will have to pay a lot here we have uh, at spline we, we did so much video clips that had no money but it was just easy to to do uh, motion control because we just had very very uh little short times to prep even if it was complex move, so it was very tiny. And for the for the fleeing tracking, it's the same. We just bring the, the time of prep and the calibration and everything very shortly to optimize the time because time is money. And mm. if you optimize the time of prep and everything of workflow, everything you you can um, you can get down the cost. And this is what why we we do that. Mm. Cool. Thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, so thank you for the, the presentation and for sticking around thank to answer some much. questions. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, have a good evening. See you. Bye bye. Cool. Thank you very Take much. Care. Bye bye. So that was Romain Bozex from Spline in France talking about motion control and virtual production. We're going to move on now to our final presentation of the evening. Uh, we're going to circle back to Star Wars and we're going to change format a little bit. We're having two different uh, Danish creators of Star Wars fan films uh, on at the same time to do a little group discussion of their work. Um, so we are going to now see uh, Shabazz Sarwar and Peter Rongstil are going to present Shrouded Destiny and Jesper Tunis is going to present The Last Padawan 2. So we're going to see some trailers and a little bit of behind the scene footage from, from the two projects and then move to a conversation with the creators. like getting into a scrap, don't you? Someone's got to do it. Indeed. Indeed. My name 
Bruce Tulick. I'm here to retrieve an acquisition. What brings you here? A hardened criminal? Tax evader? Strange spouse? Murderer. Oh, so somebody's in trouble, eh? The work I'm setting out to do is important, crucial to the galaxy. We've been on the run for so long. We haven't had a chance to get to you by my crystal. Jill, you know, I can't shake the feeling that you're somehow familiar. Here for a drink while my ship gets prepared. Good sir. <laughs> Sorry, uh, ma'am. after your drink is. Why does the Empire hunt you? All you do is hide in the woods while people die. Why would the Empire come here, seal off an entire planet? Murder and torture innocent people. Just to catch one guy. You tell me. Because they're looking for a Jedi. I overestimated you, Padawan. I thought if I touched a hair of innocence, you would come running. But no. Very un-Jedi of you. The Empire killed everyone I knew. My friends. My master. They died so I would live. To do what? win this war. Okay. Uh, for at gennemgå slåskampen med Heeway og Isaac og Jax og Padawan, så får I lige the grand tour of the location. Man ser simpelthen en, uh, en TIE Fighter komme flyvende hen over her. Flyve hen over hovedet på Isaac og Tarvi, de mødes, så begynder alle at skyde på hinanden. Og de løber tilbage, skyder og bang, 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 og Bella bliver skudt og ramt, og får stillet sig her. Han står og skyder for at holde dem presset, men de bliver ved med ligesom at prøve at komme frem. Og det ender med, at rebellerne, der både er over på højen derovre, og på den anden side af den her, dør, og han er sådan helt presset. Vi ser en rebell, der falder om, og han råber, Jax, og hun griber det store gevær, kommer frem i den og skyder. Last Padawan 2 bliver helt klart et, et, et skridt op fra det, Jesper han lavede sidst. 
Det skulle ikke være sådan noget, men nu laver vi en til, og så laver vi bare en kamp. Altså, jeg synes jo, det er helt vildt fedt, at man våger og kaster sig ud i at lave fanart i den skala. Det var sjovt, men det er også mere sådan en, kan det lade sig gøre? Det der med, at setup er så stort, som det er, ikke? Man får kostymet på første gang. Det her, det er dit våben. Din hat skal sidde sådan, den skal vende. Altså, sådan nogle ting er bare sådan, okay, der, der er fandme styr på det, ikke? Det er, at vi alle sammen bare kaster os ind i det. Det er fuldstændig vanvittigt. Så det er, vi skal lave en lightsaber fight, TIE fighter fight, then it's lunchtime. Noget af det, der har talt til drengerøven i mig og barnet fra 70'erne, det, det var jo helt klart, da der kom sådan en, en, en lang række af stormtrooper <laughs> imod mig med våben med hævet og sådan noget, ikke? Det var sådan... Okay, det er lidt det her, ikke? At være udenfor i naturen, hvor det regner og det blæser, og der er jo ikke rigtig noget, der er fake på den måde. Altså de der vadhavsskud, hvor man ser ud over med de her nærmest fatimogana-agtige spejlinger, det tænker jeg, hvorfor er det, de bruger så mange penge på at lege et stort studie eller tage til Marokko og filme? De kan jo bare komme her. Det er jo lidt en barndomstrøm, at man kan komme til at spille i sådan en film, og så være helten i det, ikke? Jeg, jeg var der øh, nogle dage, hvor det bare silede ned fra morgen til aften. Vi var ude ved Vesterhavet, og man er kold. Faktisk ret kold. Efter første dag på Rømø, der snakkede vi om morgenen om, hvorvidt det her det overhovedet kunne lade sig gøre. Om vi bare skulle øh, hive stikket. Det her, det skal bare lykkes. Og så gør vi, hvad der skal til. Man sov i sand. Man tog sand på om morgenen. Der var sand i en kravgry. Altså, man kan ikke lave en omelet uden at slå det ikke i stykker. Vi bliver alle sammen presset, og det er sindssygt hårdt. Men det, der sådan, ligesom samler os i sidste ende, det er, at vi rigtig gerne vil det. Jeg håber, at sådan et projekt som det her kan være med til at inspirere andre, der har ligesom noget, de, de vil gerne være af med og få det lavet, fordi man kan se, okay, man kan godt med et sådan nogenlunde begrænset budget få indfriet nogle drømme og række ud efter stjernerne. Get out of here. Get out of here. So, those were the trailers and behind-the-scenes footage for our two Danish-made Star Wars fan films. We're now going to go to a conversation with uh, Shabazz, who's the creator of Shrouded Destiny, Peter, who is the VFX supervisor for Shrouded Destiny, and Jesper, who is the creator of The Last Padawan 2. Hello, everyone. I can see that I'm muted. There we go. I'm not muted anymore. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hey. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Yep. Well, thank you. Yep, and uh, we just want to apologize quickly for uh, the the time. As you know, with these things, time slips away from us a bit. So thank you very much for your patience, and we're very happy to have you guys here with us. Um, <clears throat> so, very cool stuff. Obviously, you've all spent a lot of time and energy and blood, sweat, and tears uh, to create these projects. And so, uh, Shabazz and Jesper, I want to start out by, um, I guess, asking you both to talk a little bit about uh, what 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 brought you. To the to the point of um, of wanting to make a film like this, what was your what was your goal, and and how did you go about starting that as a as a sort of one person army that needs to gather a whole crew together to do this? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, but you go first. Oh, thank you very much, famous. Well, I um, I grew up. Uh, I'm from 1990, and I grew up. I grew up watching Ron Howard, Steven Spielberg movies, James Cameron movies. And uh, that was always my dream of filmmaking, the, what I wanted to do. And um, in 2015, when I had just started taking my first big leaps into filmmaking, I, uh, I saw The Force Awakens. I was a, a Star Wars fan before that, but I saw The Force Awakens and I saw how they somehow, somehow managed to create this adventure and still like distill Star Wars down to its foundation and what what like the sounds and the settings and everything just felt like really Star Wars and I was inspired by that. So I, I really wanted to make a film that resembled just in some small way the films that I loved and loved grew, uh, growing up. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, well, I also had an awakening at the same time as Jesper did. Um, there was, oh, no one intended. Um, but um, I think the main difference for me was that there were a lot of Star Wars fan films out there uh, over the decades, but I never felt that there was um, 
um, the courage to actually go ahead and make something that really delved into some deeper storytelling and uh, greater focus on the uh, actors, uh, uh, you know, doing their work uh, as you would normally see. You have a lot of people who are very interested in being a part of the universe, you know, living out their childhood dreams. But as an entertainer, as an actor and a writer and a director, I also know that you also want to do something else for the fans uh, and not just for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So it became a mixture of trying to make something that would challenge the fan film community. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, just trying to figure out what is possible here in Denmark. Because we have mm -hmm. this idea that, you know, you can only do social realism and um, a couple of fairy tales every once, every four years or something. Um, but I do believe that Denmark has the potential for making um, high rate science fiction. And uh, yes, but I are challenging that notion and hopefully uh, we'll be delivering on that promise uh, come next year. Cool, good. And do you both, um, just quickly, can you both tell us a bit about your backgrounds? Do you both come from a, a sort of filmmaking uh, background or, or how, did, how, did, how did that come in? I started, uh, I, I've been making films my my entire life. I, film and theater and music just was a huge part of my, my childhood. Uh, so I, I moved to Copenhagen in 2011 to pursue acting and filmmaking and has been living off that ever since and made a bunch of short films and directed a bunch of plays and uh, for the last well i made the last Padawan one in 2016 so yeah for four years now it's been uh i mean i'm and i'm working on the sequel now so yeah for the last four years it's been star wars <laughs> mainly cool for myself i've been um uh, pursuing the line of acting since I was 18 um, and I uh, thought I was going to have a, a, a just a big wonderful splash uh, almost immediately um, uh, and, 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 and all like career wise and that didn't happen uh, so a couple, like six seven years after that I started getting into writing and directing and um, I've just been trying to gather up all kinds of tidbits uh, knowledge understanding of how to craft a story how to get people together to make something, um, finding out what triggers people and what gets them activated. And then uh, almost five years ago, I decided that, um, yeah, uh, I think I want to do my most ambitious project. And I didn't think it was going to take this long. But uh, <laughs> in general, with anything that I do or say, I always have an idea of something happening. And then it's you always have to add a lot of years before it actually comes to fruition. Um, I, I hope to change that part of my life soon. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, and Peter, I want to bring you in here now as well. So you you were the, the VFX supervisor on Shrouded Destiny, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, well, actually, I just I just joined the project like, what's it been now? Four months? Five months, maybe? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I wasn't actually part of the, uh, of the actual shoot or anything, but I came in afterwards, yeah. Okay, and so how did you how did you get involved in the project? When, when did you first become aware of it? And uh, yeah, how, did, how was your uh, process of, of coming into a project that was already in 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 production going? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Well, I, being a huge Star Wars fan, I had of course heard about uh, both uh, Yes Franchise uh, uh, movies earlier, mm. um, and I think. Actually, just out of the blue, you dropped me an email, Shabas, asking if I could be interested in working on the uh, on on the episode. And uh, I figured, yeah, hey, why not? <laughs> it's Star Wars. Who doesn't like Star Wars? I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, mm, figuring out that I would do a couple of shots, maybe, <laughs> uh, and, then, <laughs> and then ending up, yeah, uh, agreeing to become the uh, the, uh, the effect supervisor for the uh, <laughs> for the entire episode. Okay. Cool. And what is um, what is your background? How did why um, why would Shabazz have, have said I'm going to write to Peter and ask him to come in and be my VFX supervisor? Uh, yeah, that's because I'm the VFX supervisor at uh, Devo Post Production uh, here in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. uh, and have been working uh, in VFX for the last 10, 15 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Good. Um, <clears throat> So I see the next question. I'm going to try to pull together a couple of different questions into one thing here because I think they're all interconnected. Um, what's really interesting about the the um, both of these films and the way that you're working is that, of course, that you are um, you're working with uh, sort of professional grade. You're working with people who are professionals in their field, 
Um, you're working with you know, so professional level special effects. You're working with professional actors. Um, but obviously, I know that one of the rules about uh, being allowed to use the Star Wars IP is that no one's allowed to get paid for the work. So what are the various, um, how would this sort of, if you wanted to do a project like this that wasn't a Star Wars project, um, and you wanted to do it at a professional level, uh, let's say you wanted to do it as a, as a professional paid production, um, what would that change about it? What are the, what advantages would come in and perhaps what disadvantages might come in? Um, and can you talk about the, the relationship between um, professionalism and what you are and are not able to do with a project like this? Um, okay, so um, one of the reasons why this project has taken such a long time is that you have to accept the fact that people, especially post-production, um, are investing their free time. Mm. Um, and that means that everything paid has to come first. And, 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 and I've been fortunate that I'll, um, a lot of the people in some of the really, you know, with the bigger capacities as well, have actually pushed paid work away because they saw a greater potential in this, mm. which is, you know, a, a luxury situation to be in, which most people working on our level would not actually get to experience. Mm. Um, so if this were a paid professional production, you know, working in, a, in, a, in an original universe, Obviously, if you have money to give people, they will be able to set out some time and say, we're going to do this work at this time. They don't have to worry about rent, uh, food, clothes on their body and all that. Uh, so they're, they're going to be invested in that sense. Mm. The way people have been invested in this is that even though it's you know on a volunteer basis, um, I still consider it um, an obligation from anyone I uh, involved in this that they are professional. Um, and professional is not just, you know, being paid. It's also about a mindset. Um, you know, um, your word is your bond. Uh, because that's at least the approach I have towards. I've, I've been in this industry for 16 years, and I have done a lot of free work. I still work part-time at the DSB, at the train station, Central um, uh, Copenhagen Central Station. Come on by if you want to, and sort out your eyes and car or something i'll help you out with that um so i've only been actually been able to live off you know acting uh for the last two years mm. that's 2019 and 2020 mm. uh 2018 started the ball but so since i started 2004 so i have that approach that if mm. i say yes to a project which you know you're giving your volunteer time mm -hmm. you have me in the same sense that if you were paying me um, but I also understand that's not everyone's mindset. That's not everyone's, um, liberty. You know, you got family, you got mortgages and all that. I don't have anything of, of that sort right now. Um, so uh, I guess timeline, you know, if you write on a teaser trailer, like someone did that it will be released in 2019, <laughs> you can actually most likely keep that promise instead mm. of being here in 2020, you know, at the edges of it and go huh, 2021, huh? Um, mm. so that's, that's probably one of the major ones, you know, you can, you can keep a schedule. Mm -hmm. I, um, I work as a, as a first assistant director in the, in the Danish film industry and do a lot of work, you know, behind, uh, behind the camera with the director and the whole production, like trying to solve how, how you do scheduling uh, on a film production, how you solve some of the creative challenges that, uh, think that comes out of just reading a script and, and, and thinking about how, how are we going to make this, this real? And uh, I definitely think that we can make uh, these kind of more spectacle and fantastical stories in Denmark. We do it uh, quite often. I think that uh, the last year's Christmas, uh, we do Julekalender here in Denmark. It's like a Christmas series that goes all the way, like every day in December, there's, a, there's like a small episode. And, and those are getting really like, uh, they look really great and the story is good. And, you know, it's, I think those are, are, are really impressive and when um so i think we have the, the the capacity to do it but of course if you did a production like the last paddle one two it would like everybody had to get paid and that expense would be uh quite extreme uh compared to the budget of the film we mm. we made this film film for thirty thousand mm. dollars and you know as there's like this this saying that you know you can if we can make it cheap but then it takes a long time mm. Uh, oh yeah, we can make it good, but then it gets expensive. Uh, and and we when we worked on set, we had these moments because we shot everything outside, and we shot in the in the uh, in the Warden Sea in on the west coast of Denmark, like in the middle of the sea. When the water goes down, you can stand like on on the on the 
like on the on the <laughs> on the seabed, and we yeah. shot some action sequences out there. And uh, we, I had this saying that every time, like we had like people in the like a, a kilometer away, we'd have we had some tourist walking or something like that. I'd be like, no, don't do anything, because I would rather waste like five hours fixing the fixing this in post than five minutes of like wasting everybody's time here mm. standing in the rain, mm. uh, because my work on this production is free. Mm. And I can do it all by myself. I'm also the visual effects supervisor, so I do like uh, on a night like tonight. I'm sitting and doing. Uh, I'm I'm doing my first uh, passes on the lightsabers in a film right now, and mm. you know, one frame at a time. It's just a. Uh, it's a lot of. Uh, it's a lot of really minutious storytelling going on there. <laughs> mm. Mm. Cool. Thank you. Um, this sort of uh, segues into the our, our first audience question. Um, Cornelius D asks, what was the selling point for getting all those people on board? And maybe um, uh, Peter will bring you in first to answer this question. What was the selling point that brought you on board? And then we can have uh, Shabazz and Jesper talk about uh, how they talk to others. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, I'm a sucker for Star Wars, aren't I? Mm. I mean, Shabazz, you, you had me at, at Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just say lightsaber, isn't it? Yeah, hey, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think that was it. Uh, I was quite certain uh, from the very beginning that I wouldn't do this as a company, uh, but mm. I would do this as in my own time. Um, and I have been very careful so far asking other people to come aboard mm. because since we're also a company, we do normally hire people to, to work mm. for us. And I wouldn't want to give people the impression that they would have to do this work for free in order to get a paid job. Right. Later. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. So mostly it was it was a it was a love for the idea of being able to work on a Star Wars film that, that drew you in. It's the love of being able to work from a Star Wars <laughs> on a Star Wars film, yeah. And of course, also when you see someone who has that kind of, of drive uh, mm. to actually invest all of this blood, sweat, and tears into a, a, a fan film, I think they should be that it should be honored and. I, I really wanted to be a part of that, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, Shabazz and Jesper, how did you approach those conversations with your creative teams? Um, well, for me, um, I went in, you know, um, you know, I didn't really test the waters, you know, putting my toes in there. I just really cannonballed my way in there. Mm. I will say, um, to Jesper's credit, he's actually partly responsible for the fact that I went with this approach that I did because... Mm. I had written a, a 30 page uh, script to begin with, and I um, uh, sent it to some people and I got a lot of feedback. And yes, but was one of the first people to say, um, I like the way you're going, but if you want people to get invested in this idea, you have to, you can't do the whole thing right now. And it wasn't, it wasn't in any kind of like ball busting way. It was more of like a, an assessment of where I was and where the industry was at the time. So go for a scene that will sort of encapsulate whatever you're trying to do and um, and then make that and pour your heart into that and then showcase that from there you can draw people in. Mm -hmm. So um, I had a small crew of uh, between 15 and 30 people when everything was then done for the first test scene mm -hmm. that was released two years ago. And I used that to get people involved. And mm -hmm. luckily, I managed to get Lars Mikkelsen involved with that one uh, to start with. And then I had the news of Lars being involved before I released the short film to get people excited about, you know, what the hell did he make that made mm. people think, you know, that made Lars go, okay, I'll be a part of this. Mm -hmm. um, so I had that advantage, but it was basically just um, having a conversation, um, um, knowing what it is you're doing, uh, being honest about your ambitions. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you're lucky to hook a couple of people that have some credentials that are better than yours because, uh, let's face it, people didn't necessarily come to do this to work with me um, mm -hmm. they did it because there were other people of, you know, um, greater uh, renown uh, in the industry. And um, and I'm, I'm glad that I've been able to give that opportunity to people that some people could work with Daniel Stilling, our photographer who has, you know, 15 years of experience in Hollywood. Stunt woman, uh, Laura Nogadigbo, mm. uh, who's been a wonderful woman in Justice League and, and Black Widow coming yeah. uh, hopefully soon, um, and stuff like that that I couldn't, I, I couldn't give him that star power. And then mm. with Lars Nicholson. 
So yeah. it was about being lucky to attract the attention of, you know, some big name people, mm -hmm. being honest, um, mm -hmm. and then kind of using them to hook everyone else. Yeah, yeah. I guess at this point, I do, I do have to ask, are you able to say a little bit about what you said that did get Lars Mikkelsen on board? Um, well, I asked him, I had to ask him twice. The first time I asked him, he respectfully declined. Mm -hmm. um, to be fair, he had to do a lot of really important stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go to the dentist or something. Um, but then um, I had managed to work with him on a series called uh, Hans Vi in mm -hmm. English called Ride Upon the Storm. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, not to toot my own horn, he just thought I was a cool guy, which uh, is true. It's 100% uh, <laughs> truthful. Um, and uh, then five months later, uh, we had finished uh, post production on um, the short film. And then I was like, you know what? I asked him almost two years ago. He said, I'm too busy. Realistically, I can get involved in like two years. That was his way of saying no. But because I'm literal sometimes, like, you know, Drax from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, I was like, okay, two years, two years is up. I'm going to ask him again. And um, then this time he said yes. Um, it, was, it was basically just showing him that short film and um, the level of professionalism I showed him five months earlier working with him as an actor. Cool. I don't. I don't know if we should add a disclaimer in here that this probably isn't an invitation to go pester your your favorite uh, local celebrity <laughs> to, to be involved in your personal project. <laughs> but yeah. So um, yes, but what's um, uh, what was your project? How did you how did you pitch it to people? How did you get them on board? Uh, well, gradually through the process of making the films, we made we made a, the first film and we made a, also a, like a campaign trailer to get people hyped for the second film. Uh, and then we then we shot the, the the sequel last November 2019, and through that entire process, um, me and uh, me and the, the the other producer Nina Fufet, we had this uh, wonderful uh, saying that uh, it's right that you have to put in 10,000 hours to be great at something, but you also have to do 10,000 phone calls because mm. uh, the way of keeping like, the budget down or something like this or like finding opportunities is to call around and ask. And you know, get in contact with people and call up restaurants and ask if they will like give a, your film hardworking film crew a meal <laughs> and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But also, when it comes to to actors and of course uh, filmmakers and uh, the whole like the people making the film, we uh, we did have something to show. But I've also made a bunch of other stuff, and my work as a first AD was really good at like. I have some connections that I could talk to and some people that I love, like working with that I, of course, uh, pulled in on this project. Uh, but I, I would always ask people um, not only like not to think about what this project, not, not just to think about what they could do for the project, but also what this project could do for them. Mm. Because this whole, like the whole paddle, the, the whole last paddle one project is like, um, it's, it's built as a platform for people to show their talent. There's like a new generation of filmmakers coming up and we're all part of the VHS, VHS you know, born with the internet and a camera in our pocket generation. And we, like, we have to somehow now show uh, what, like, what, whole, what that whole availability have like created in our generation. Mm. And um, we want, really wanted to do that in the last, had one so like when I talk to people I was always like what do you want like what 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 do you dream of this is my dream of making a film I want to make an action adventure movie but what do you dream of do you dream of making something in particular that we have to like involve in the production or like do you want me to like do what can I can I do some PR for you or like what what uh, what do you need mm. uh, so then that has been really nice because that also means that people go into the project uh, with their own agenda and mm. like they, they have something that they want to get out of it, and and we we talk about it, and we try to make that happen. Mm. Cool. So you're not just going and saying, "Here, come do this thing for me." You're saying, "I'm doing this thing. How can we make it uh, as as good of a, an opportunity for you as it is for for my idea?" Basically. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. People shouldn't be like people shouldn't feel they're wasting their time. They should yeah. feel like they're getting something out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to, since since the sort of overall theme of, of VizArts has been uh, virtual production techniques, so everything from motion capture to LED walls to the motion control camera that we saw, um, 
can you each say a bit about maybe how much of the sort of, uh, how do you see the, the new trends in virtual production uh, possibly affecting this sort of work in the future? Um, do you see it uh, opening up possibilities for you or is there anything that you would do differently now uh, as opposed to how you did it a few years ago? Um, and, and just sort of what opportunities do you feel like uh, these real-time production tools might bring to these kinds of productions? And will they perhaps open up more opportunities within the Danish film industry to do work like this? Thank you for your simple, short questions. Um, <laughs> so what I would say, I mean, all this stuff uh, coming out now, I mean, seeing The Mandalorian um, and, and the behind the scenes of all that has been wonderful to watch, but also you immediately if you don't get intimidated, you're also a little bit, well, okay, maybe a little bit frustrated because you're not going to be working with stuff at that scale right now. Uh, mm -hmm. In America, you can have something like that because their culture of storytelling is quite vast. I mean, there are, you know, you know, we call something like genre movies here almost in like, you know, ooh, a stinky poo poo kind of way, but mm -hmm. In, in America, there are more possibilities to tell stories like that. They feel more real, um, despite it being space wizards and traveling from planet to planet like this. Um, but the way that Yespa's project has been made, the way my project has been made, you know, the 10,000 phone calls, yes. I mean, you know, I had a, a producer's group of like five, six people who would call daily to, to people asking for all kinds of favors. And a lot of the things that, you know, wound up being a success for us was, well, we have this availability because no one is using it at this time and mm -hmm. we're inspired by a price. So we want to help you out. But that's like, you know, giving us some food. That's giving you a huge discount on some equipment or a, a stage or something like that. But the price is right now for um, an LED stage, like uh, Romain said, um, if even with a massive discount for uh, an LED stage, um, it might not actually be a viable solution for us yet. Mm -hmm. So it's more how I imagine is the more of the bigger companies um, need to be working with this, uh, making a market for the LED stages, pouring some money in there. So when the LED stage areas have some, you know, surplus, they can mm -hmm. go, okay, we have some space to, let some kids in, have some fun. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that's where, you know, as someone at my stage will be coming in and say, hey, I'm one of those kids. Um, but um, if I had to compete with a major production, um, you know, something like Nordisk Film or, um, or SF or any one of those guys showing up with their money and a good idea, and I show up with a great idea, but no money, mm. well, it's going to have to be a good idea for this time. Um, yeah. And um, that's just the harsh reality of it right now. Mm -hmm. So you, in a way, you see that it seems like you're saying the big change that needs to happen is that the people who have the money need to kind of invest in the the infrastructure and the the make it bring it bring it into being so that it's around for for smaller projects to use. Yeah, because I mean, my my fan film has um, an edge, like a feeling of that. You know, if if you build it, mm. he will come. Is the original. Um, you know, quote, but they, because you can't do one person movies. Mm. Well, and not at this level, at least. Um, so um, this was also modeled around what was possible in Denmark at that time. I, mm. I, I started coming up with this idea in 2016. Like, mm -hmm. The idea for the series mm -hmm. came about in 2016, 2017. And The Mandalorian wasn't even announced back then. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the work that uh, you see on The Mandalorian has already been slightly explored by John Favreau in a previous production of the, the Jungle Book or something, mm. but not mm. to that extent. Mm. So my project was very much based around what I believe to be possible then and there. Um, nowadays, my project is built around showcasing Denmark um, mm. because you normally mm. think of Denmark, you think of like forests and bicycles. And that's why I, I wanted to challenge uh, the notion of what Denmark was by going to different locations, physical mm. locations, mm. like mm. Arbemide, Moon, Fasa uh, Kelpul, but uh, you know, if you're if you're gonna wind up doing everything in a sound stage anyway, you can literally travel the world in in the same place, mm. um, and that could in 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 one essence be you know cost effective because you're basically just sending location scouts out to go take photos and then come back. Mm -hmm. um, very simplified, obviously, um, but 
it um, it would still be cheaper for us right now to go out to locations and shooting um and then in, you know instead of going for an led stage right now because we just mm. we don't have um the the story need right now mm. to to justify that we would need to have such um, such a setup like they have the volume in uh, in the US. Mm. Cool. I believe. Yeah. <laughs> and Jesper, what about you? We we had a scene in our film where our where one of our characters flies a tie fighter. So we did a a quite typical Star Wars thing of shooting, you know, the inside of a cockpit mm. uh, with our with our with our character sitting in there doing a doing the flying and uh, there's a window behind her and we were thinking about maybe doing a rear projection on that uh, because that is basically what like when you talk about the Mandalorian of course the whole thing about tracking the camera and, and like having the background move around with the movement is, is, is super uh, technical but mm -hmm. uh, rear projection has always been a thing and, and you know when it comes to doing same things like a TIE fighter or a car shot or you know, drive, you know, driving and, and, and scenery passing by, uh, just a small stage would be amazing to have because it, it would like ease up workflow so much. Um, but I do agree that that it is the big players who have to go in first and do these things because when the cost of bringing, let's say you're doing like a major production, like a huge Danish film, like a 30 million, 30 million crowns production or sort of 15 million crowns production, which are fairly big movies here, Mm -hmm. uh, Danish crowns, uh, and you you have to bring your crew to an extreme location. Then, if the cost of bringing the crew, feeding them, waiting for weather, you know, all that kind of stuff, when that is uh, more expensive than going to a, a virtual set and building the whole set in, uh, like on in a computer, and then working out that whole system, when that becomes cheaper than going to the location, then you will see people going to the virtual sets. Mm. Cool. And uh, Peter, do you have a perspective on this? Or is there anything that you, uh, anything with Unreal Engine, or, or how, how is this all affecting what you're doing with these kinds of projects? Um, I, well, <laughs> we have, to be fair, we haven't really done any of these projects yet. <laughs> mm. but, but when when the technology matures, uh, I think that this will definitely become more readily uh, available to, to to people. Right? I mean, I can I can imagine being able to to, to yeah well try out ideas quicker, say in, in Unreal Engine, uh, mm. block things out very quick. Mm. Doing doing yeah well, maybe even using your your previous materials further down the line, right? Mm. And as to, to to further elaborate on what Jesper said, yeah, um, say if you can go to you have to go to an extreme location such as as uh, Shabazz did here and you end up one day having to shoot a scene really really quickly because <laughs> the sun's going away yeah right you can imagine what it would give to a production being able to have say a three hour sunrise maybe mm -hmm. um just say leave leave the sun at that spot and then shoot until you're until you're done right until you have what you need <laughs> yeah i think that's the uh, that's one of the biggest advantages yeah yeah cool thank you mm -hmm. Um, we have an audience question here. Kim asks, I'm not sure if this is common knowledge, but what does Disney say to these projects? Um, I know it has nothing to do with the FX, uh, but still, yeah, what, is, what has Disney's response been to these? Um, well, Lucasfilm have, uh, have been quite gracious with regards to the fans making these productions. In, in the beginning, um, in the, like, the mid-90s or something like that, there was a bit of a legal well uh, there was some um restraint from figuring out like what is this because this was a whole new approach i mean like ooh, like ooh, people are so enthusiastic about something that you know an ip that they've made that they want to copy it and this sounds like oh this is going to be a moral gray zone and a legal gray zone mm -hmm. but then fan films you know got the the a okay and uh, there were the lucasfilm fan film awards Disney took over that. Um, it had one in 2016 and 2018. Um, funnily enough, not in 2020. I wonder if something happened this year that prevented that. Well, um, and so there is um, a slightly open embrace to this. I think the main difference between my project and and Jesper's and, and, and many others is that I'm directly vying uh, for a position with Disney mm. Lucasfilm, mm. completely unsolicited, by the way. Um, and that's why I've been working as hard as possible at doing this as 
openly and transparent as possible. So there is no place in the process where someone can go, well, something dodgy or fishy is happening here. Mm. Um, because, you know, they're, they're a very, very big company. Um, and uh, <laughs> in my mindset, I, I consider them a future employer. But, uh, you know, um, if I see 3PO standing in the back, I do, I do see 3PO standing in the back, <laughs> um, he would tell me the odds and then some ridiculous number to one. And uh, I would say, never tell me the odds. Um, but right now, I'm not actually interested in, in, in approaching this. Um, because you know it's 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 the first date, and right now I haven't showered. Yet. I have showered today. I just want to point out that. But in, in in the date analogy, I haven't even gone to that process of you know grooming myself, showering, all that. So I'm not going to go out and woo someone when I'm not ready for that process. It would be detrimental to the efforts of more than 300 people who worked on this film. Uh, it's going to be ready when it's going to be ready. We're looking at 2021 now um, because, you know, the world. Um, and um, I, 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 I still firmly and solemnly believe that we have something very powerful. We're continuing to get people on board, um, even though it's been quite a while since we started. And it's because they see that there is something um, worth, you know, um, joining. Um, but uh, yeah, for, for, I'm, I'm sure in some capacity, they have some slight knowledge of it, but I haven't been privy to any of that for now. I am still here. I see that my square has gone black, but I am still here. <laughs> it's Black Friday soon. <laughs> I guess so. Maybe that's what's happening. My the the camera has checked out to go buy another version. Are you of on itself. sale? <laughs> yeah. Uh, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So yes, but what was um, what, what, what's your interaction with Disney been like around? Have you had any interaction with them or? Uh, no, uh, we're following the same rule, rules as uh, Shabazz is, um, which is that uh, you know, uh, it's the same thing. If you like try to interpret every every other artist's work, that like, you have to of course respect the original piece and uh, and create something that is uh, and like not not harmful to the brand. Which mm. uh, I also think would be like it's a fan film, so uh, it's more like a celebration of everything that is Star Wars. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it's uh, I think it's 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 there is uh, this is the question that always comes up. Like people want to know if if it's like dramatic or dangerous or something like that, and um, it really isn't. It uh, it is quite uh, good, but it's also nice because it draws the line really nicely that you can like as you talked about about not uh, being able to pay anyone. Mm. I love the aspect like that nobody gets paid. Mm. That that is just like either like everybody gets paid or nobody gets paid. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, good. So it's it's yeah it's one or the other for everyone basically. Good. Yeah. Um, we have a multi-part question here from uh, from Henrik, the the founder of Vizarts. Um, so I'm going to try to run through them quickly. Um, the first one is um, in the behind the scenes uh, for Jesper, your video. You say, um, oh, okay, I'm going to have to pronounce a Danish name here, so I'm, you know, forgive me if I say it wrong. Um, why go to Morocco if we can just go to Velhail? Um, yes. Is the, is the question then now, why go to Rumu if we can do it in virtual production? Well, if you give me a studio and put in the sand and the water and, a, and like a 4K light and then create that whole thing in Unreal Engine, I will, I will love to go to... Uh, that place instead, but the 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 Warden Sea was free, mm. so uh, <laughs> and uh, and we sh and we like we I scouted like we the, the Warden Sea is a long stretch of, of ocean, and I scouted a lot of it to find like the, the, the right place where with a parking lot close by, and when the water was actually down, we could drive all the way out there, and uh, so like our whole, whole film is made in like it, it, I I spent two years. Uh, Two years writing and like and, and pre-producing, because I had to write a film for certain locations to make it as affordable as possible. Um, and I do love the like. That's also when it comes to like virtual reality, like the whole aspect of that you have to sit down with your that with your VFX team and plan out the shots ahead are amazing, uh, especially in this like genre of film because the closer you can get to like plan out your exact vision uh, before going on on set i really do believe can 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 create a better end result cool 
Thank you. And right now you don't get the money. Like if you're doing VFX on uh, on anything, uh, they you don't have any pre-production. Like that's maybe like that's that's not that's not that normal. Maybe one day or two days where you like for a whole thing, and that's just like if you had to do like a. a, a a virtual volume, you would have to sit down for weeks and plan mm -hmm. and talk with the director and the like the, the production designer. And that would be, I think, so many good conversations and problems could be solved before going on set. Yeah, that's one of the things we keep hearing in, in these conversations over and over is that post-production is now pre-production. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, next question, how do you think indie filmmakers can benefit from virtual production? I guess we sort of covered that, but um, any other thoughts you want to throw in? <laughs> I think with the, we have to remember that Denmark uh, is a country of fairy tales. I mean, H.C. Anderson is one of our most popular um, mm. writers. Um, and I feel, and also one of the reasons why I leapt into this idea of making fantasy-based storytelling in Denmark is that I think there's a, an identity, if not a crisis, but a sense of loss there. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, you know, it's it's only around Christmas we have that, you know, um, submission to, you know, elves and gnomes and all that. Uh, and then the rest of the time, it's just like, you know, everything is just, you know, black and white. What you see is what you get. Nothing else magical exists. Mm. Um, and I think that has obviously affected a lot of the storytelling that we do here in the country. But if we also... it. I don't know where to start. I don't know if it's us that need to make the stories that get people to go, okay, so let's build a platform for these people to tell these stories, or do you build the platform and then people are like, well, since there is a possibility, because you're not really gonna use virtual production to shoot a kitchen sink drama. I think that's a very uh, Americanization of a Danish expression, um, because there are a lot of homes in this country, at least 20. Um, so you can just shoot that there. Um, mm -hmm. If you need to have a scene where someone is having, you know, a, a meltdown in a car, there are a lot of cars, and you don't need to do that in virtual production. But if you need to go out to an inhospitable environment or a, a fantastical place, you know, virtual production is the place to go. And mm -hmm. something like that, yes, was working on, I am working on. We would love stuff like that. But right now, the finances, when it comes to giving money to people like us, right now, is not as prevalent um, as it could be, but I'm thinking that Jesper and my projects will be able to push people forward um, to to making that more of a reality. Mm -hmm. you, you got Ghost VFX who are doing, you know, just gangbusters uh, working on stuff that we don't really have here in Denmark that much. You know, you had Valhalla, uh, mm -hmm. you had Skamans mm -hmm. Data 1 and 2, Vilhex, and then these uh, Christmas calendars, but these are very much in the rarity. Uh, a lot of our storytelling is based on social realism. Um, so for, for us to be able to, on an indie production level, it, it's, it's still like the big companies have to um, put some money into it um, to make sure that, um, and also get some money back from the audience going to watch their stuff. Hmm. And then the indie filmmakers will be able to show up with their experimental ideas and go, you know what, for a fraction of that, we can give you something and maybe it'll be a good investment, maybe not. But you have enough money from the more established players. So if this doesn't work out, it's not that big of a deal. Mm. I think it would be a huge deal if, uh, if our projects, like the things that we are making, uh, could, could show that uh, these things can be made in Denmark and they don't have to cost a million bucks to do. And uh, yeah, there is there is some possibility here. You just have to be creative about it, mm. uh, and 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 also that you shouldn't be afraid of VFX. Mm. But that whole that whole process of creating VFX is just becoming, for for, for every day, it's like uh, it's becoming uh, more and more see through. Mm. Everybody can do it, and I think that, uh, like I'm sitting here doing all the VFX for the last Padawan two uh, on an iMac from 2017 with an external eGPU. And uh, I just wait. Like I'm a dumpster kind of computer kind of guy. All my filmmaking computers have always been built by me, like getting handed something over and then opening it up and fixing it, you know? And, and um, if people really want to create these sorts of things, I think that it, it's, it's going to happen. I just hope that the industry doesn't like get an overhaul from, 
for, for from like uh, a younger generation working in Blender, mm. uh, doing everything on a MacBook Pro, because mm. uh, that is going to happen really soon. Uh, I, I I have no education in VFX, and I do I do like uh, I work in Cinema 4D, and I work in Blender, and After Effects, and you know Premiere, and all of that, and it's all just learned by watching YouTube. Mm. So I think uh, mm. the evolution is coming, not in a not in a big dramatic way, but in a whimper. It's just gonna happen slowly, and that's also a thing. Like when we talk about virtual production, I think that it is going to, like Shabazz talks about, about like doing car shots and stuff. If the technology keeps evolving uh, as all technology does, like at some point people are going to do car, like car shots in virtual reality, mm. because when the availability becomes so easy that you can do it to, like for cheap, uh, it's going to happen. Not just on big projects, but also in small projects. I uh, like I was doing an Audi commercial uh, this summer, and I was we were sitting in a meeting, and and the creatives were coming up with a. With a, with a shot they wanted to do. And I think that one of them had just seen The Mandalorian and they were just like, do you have a stage like that? They, that was like their thing. Cause they were here in Denmark because of, of, of Corona. Because mm. like we were one of the countries where you could actually shoot a big car commercial uh, during summer. And they were like, do you have a set like that? So, so like, mm. it, uh, even, like it, it doesn't matter if the technology is ready cause the people who want, want to use it are already here mm. because uh, they can see it and they can see how it works. Just to show off my technical prowess, uh, tip out there, if you double press the uh, Google Chrome uh, button, you go to the internet. <laughs> ah, that's a good tip. Good tip. Uh, Write that one down, everyone. It's a <laughs> nice life hack. <laughs> uh, I'm going to continue on with Hendrik's questions here. So we have, um, as indie filmmakers, how would you like to get started? Well, OK, I think we've co sort of covered this already. Um, mm. I think we've kind of covered a lot of this, actually. It's, um, do you see any ways that these techniques can make film production cheaper and more creative? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, with my production, um, we went to, um, we went to Robbie Amine, and uh, we had a 12-hour day for, uh, planned for the first day and a 10-hour day for the next day. Um, and uh, all the while, we were just praying that there would be great sun and no rain. It's just a, a great looking sun and no rain and we would be happy. I mean, there could be, there could, there, could no, there could be no possibility where if we got those two things, something would go wrong. Um, and then we were reminded of the fact that when you go to a very sand heavy area, if there is wind, um, life sucks. Um, so that was, that was the most terrible day of our production. And, you know, if that had been a paid of production where we went there uh, and had a 12 hour day planned, we had to stop after two. Mm. And, you know, you would still have to pay your crew for that entire day. Mm. Um, and that's, that's a huge uh, financial loss, potentially, uh, if you're going for traditional filmmaking. Whereas if you were in the studio um, with LED projection, you're not going to have that situation where every time just, you know, the smallest crevice of your body opens, sand will enter. Um, and, and, and some of the people's um, equipment also got some souvenirs there. Um, and that's just, mm -hmm. that was a huge hassle. And that was where I was aware of the fact that, you know, that one of the reasons why we don't shoot so much in that location, um, because it's, 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 a, it's a swear word. Um, and then um, going to Moon as well, we also had some problems there with um, one of the huge climactic scenes there we had. 45 minutes to shoot it, um, and um, the bridge we had to go down, about six or seven of the steps were now covered with water because the water had ridden so much that we couldn't actually come down normally. Um, so, so we had to, you know, had someone to have to go jump in the water. So it was like up to like uh, above knee height and then carry the equipment over very, very carefully. And this is, this is six digit number equipment here that we have to carefully give over a by arm and then get over and then, you know, you're wet. And it was just, it was a really big hassle. Um, limestone quarry, uh, the sun is going down. One of the huge climatic scenes there. You have 37 minutes to finish this whole thing. We were supposed to do the whole thing blocking wise, talking through, rehearsing everything, two hours. 
So you have like there there were so many reasons why our production would have hugely benefited from a virtual production setup. Um, and that was, and it wasn't um, necessarily poor planning. It's just, you know, when you make films, you have delays. Um, it's just nicer to have delays where you're not being killed by sand or the light you need is gone and you have to go for the next day or you're, mm -hmm. you're drowning. Yeah, well, otherwise it was great making this film. I love it. <laughs> but I have to say like, when I watched The Mandalorian still, like in the first season, there's no wind. And and mm. and, and there, on, there no, are no, the opening and, shot, the opening shot when the man and Lauren and he goes, <laughs> and, and uh, they, they have someone going there, with, and his cape is whistling. So, but 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 then again, like <laughs> I, because I I may be old fashioned, I may be old fashioned, but I do really also I like the extreme sport of making films. Mm. I also like going hiking, you know, and stuff. So I I really uh, we shot everything outside, and that is like I I used to play Star Wars outside. I used to play. You know, uh, running around the forest. I grew up, I grew up in the countryside, uh, so running around the forest with a stick, pretending it to be a lightsaber. Uh, like I felt like standing in the middle of the Warden Sea with a good old western wind direct, directly in my face. That was uh, that was appropriate. So uh, yeah, well, gives, and then, as an actor, it gives you a lot to have uh, the elements working with or against you. Um, so yeah, that's a huge gift, but you know, uh, if you can create an entire world almost, or at least a location with virtual production, I'm thinking these things will, it will just add to, you know, if you look at the prequel trilogy, the actors had to imagine a lot of the world, um, and they still managed to, to some extent, uh, work that into their performances. Um, I think imagining like these physical things it will be easier to put that in in people's faces as an actor instead of i think um carl weathers said it the best that you know if you had a whole, a whole green screen thing each actor on the stage has to imagine their own reality and respond to that but if you at least have the entire world around you you're all responding to the same thing i think the physical uh, elements will be um will be something that's a lot easier to implement um uh, very early and I think they're already kind of doing that um, with building the sets inside um, and you know kind of like making it an amalgam of the LED screens um, with like a half spaceship pouring sand all over the ground um, you know doing all that stuff so I'm not necessarily worried about not being able to get the realism of an outdoor set indoors I think that's one of the least concerns it's it's the financial part it's definitely having studios uh, allowing you to work with that stuff um, with a lesser budget and uh, being okay with that that, that, that that concerns me at this current juncture. I can't, I can't stop thinking about uh, when talking about what we're like when thinking about what virtual production is going to do for film that it, it takes me like, I can't stop thinking about like uh, Francis Ford Coppola did a movie called one from the heart, which was like a big, it's like a drama, but it's shot like a Technicolor musical. Like, uh, well, look at movies like uh, Cleopatra and Cleopatra and Sing in the Rain and and One from the Heart and all these things. They're all shot on sound stages because the gear, the technology back then, couldn't handle in, to the same extent going outside. And those movies, they have a look and a feel, which are its own thing. And I think virtual production will also have that's going forward like always and there is a part of making arts which is about like um getting the unexpected uh which is wonderful when you go outside and just point your camera in the direction you get something that you didn't expect and didn't write so so i i think that that, that as everything uh like george lucas when he did the first movies in the 70s they were uh, an example of how creative film can be with uh, mechanics and, and tracking cameras and mo like motion control and puppets. When he did the prequels, he showed us all what you can do with a green screen and a computer. And now they're doing the Mandalorian and they're showing us all what you can do with uh, virtual sets, but it's still only a tool. If you overuse it, it will, like you will be able to tell and it will take like some of the magic out of the, the film or the story, I think. In the end, people respond gonna, to stories. Sorry, I'm gonna, I mean, it, 
Okay. Shabazz, I'm, sorry, I'm going to jump in because we're, um, we're we're running out of time here. We're way out over time. <laughs> <laughs> we're way over time. Um, I do want to quickly, I've been told I have the last question here, but there were two audience questions that can we do one minute, one, one sentence answers to these questions, literally. One yes. sentence, okay? Um, will there be a local premiere for each of these movies and where? There will be uh, multiple Danish premieres for uh, the last Padawan 2 this spring. Cool. Shabazz. In Copenhagen and on the, on the West Coast. Okay, good. Shabazz? Uh, yes. Uh, at the very least, Copenhagen, also Faxa and Frederikshavn. Cool, thank you. And the other one was, um, how does someone get involved in these pro fan projects? Are there communities for that? One sentence answer. <laughs> Uh, well, Sh uh, Shabazz has been the, the best one at like doing the community thing, which he like you used Findy Film Crew to a great extent. So yeah, I think there's, a, there's there's a Facebook page called Findy Film Crew. You just have to be there at the right time. Mm. Cool. Thank you very much. And now I'm being told the last question: um, What kind of help do you need to get started with virtual production? I will I will go back to uh, a Kia Kurosawa quote because I think that's appropriate when we do uh, when we talk about Star Wars, uh, and he said like if you want to get into filmmaking, all you need is pen and paper because writing stories is uh, is the only, is is like the cheapest way of learning what film is, and uh, then storyboard a lot, and uh, and then start working in things like Blender, and you know uh, if you like. Play around with tutorials. YouTube and Blender is free. Paper is cheap. Work your imagination like a muscle. Akira Kurosawa said all that, work in Blender? No. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, well, for my sake, like, I think Jespa, if we're comparing the two directors here, I think Jespa would be more equipped to work on a set like The Mandalorian because he has a technical know-how that I don't have um, mm. at that level. Um, so for me, it would definitely be um, to have, you know, some extended time with people who work with this stuff. Hmm. Um, so I would be able to actually be a help on stage to come with my, uh, thoughts, um, instead of it just being like, oh, so wait, what is that? And how does that work? And, oh, okay. So, um, so I think Jesper is at an advantage here because he's going the way of actually understanding VFX at a greater level than I do. I'm very much dependent on VFX people around me. Um, and I'm very much... I'm still a pen and paper guy, um, but I think the way Jesper is going about, you know, becoming sort of a generalist in the filmmaking uh, industry is, is very much one of the important steps to take. And that is how much time and commitment do you actually have to do this? And Jesper really seems like um, he has it, and uh, I commend you for it, buddy. <laughs> well, thank you. Right back at you. Right back at you. So it sounds like, um, in the end, a bit of uh, a bit of training and access and and uh, opportunities to 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 work with these things and to to learn a little bit about them is is what you would want, Shabazz, if you wanted yeah, to work with these say, things. Yeah, I would say you know, master classes um, and more accessible. That it doesn't all have to be um, that you have to go to a top school where uh, you know five hundred people are trying to get in and they take in seven um, because. Uh, making this, it's, it's not uh, a, a jab at elitism. Um, mm. It's just the more accessible you make storytelling, the greater stories you're going to get because there are going to mm. be more stories out there. Mm. Um, and that's, I think, um, a, a decision um, any kind of industry needs to make with itself. Um, what do we want? Do we want people who are, you know, who get through the needle's eye and then tell us stories from there? Or do we open up for perspectives, which kind of means a democratization, making things freer or at least cheaper, um, mm -hmm. and uh, throwing it out there so people can learn? Yeah. Cool. I think we're going to let that be the last word because we're, as, as you know, we're, we're way past the time we were going to finish. But it's, um, it's been fantastic talking to you guys. Thank you so much for, uh, for sticking around and, and uh, chatting and sharing your work with us. Um, good luck with the final stages of, of getting your, your films out there. And uh, yeah, we're going to say goodnight for now. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Great. So that was Shabazz Sarwar, Peter Longstill uh, from Shroud of Destiny, and Jesper Tunis from The Last Padawan 2 talking about their work making Star Wars fan films here in Denmark.
And that concludes our program for the second night of the Visart Summit 2020. So thank you all so much for joining us here. Uh, it's been a pleasure being able to talk to all these people and, and, and share their work with you. Thank you so much to all of our guests for coming and spending time talking to us about, uh, about their work. Uh, we want to say a big, 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 big thank you to the Visarts crew, uh, Amunet Studio, who've uh, made this entire thing run so nice and smoothly and, uh, and kept everything going. And uh, they've really done a fantastic job. So thank you guys for that. Yep. Don't forget, if you want to stick around and keep chatting afterwards, you can join uh, the party in Gathertown. And you can find out how to join that on, the, uh, on Facebook and the email that you got when you signed up. I'm Alex Lehman. It's been a pleasure being your host for the evening here. And I'm going to give the last word back to Henrik, Henrik Schunau Fo, the founder of VizArts. Take it away, Henrik. Phew. <laughs> That's it. Alex uh, has been a tremendous host, I think. It's been really nice to have him on board to make this. So a big thanks to Alex. Also, a uh, huge thanks to Amonet Studio, who's been uh, the wizard crew uh, during these last couple of nights. And also starting from scratch to build a broadcast studio within a week. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, especially Nordisk Film Funden and Samsung and Aalborg University uh, because they have supported the project, project here and uh, we are really grateful for that. Also the volunteers and you know the research assistant Bjarke that has been on board uh, to help writing papers about this stuff has been great. And there's a lot of other people uh, that I don't want to mention here because then I don't forget anyone. But uh, it will take as long as uh, it will take to walk across the bridge actually to to talk about all these people that have been on board. And uh, we're just really happy that uh, we have been able to make this and to explore all the new possibilities. When we started this, there was nothing called an LED screen uh, like that we have seen on Mandalorian and so on. The motion capture was just very crude in the start and so on. The graphic cards, of course, was not as fast as they are today. So there's a lot of things that have been going on. And we can see that a lot of people have gained uh, a lot of knowledge about different things on these uh, two years. And um, also the steering committee, you know who you are out there. Thanks a lot for the help that you had and all the institutions and companies and so on that has been helping us over the last uh, two years. It's just been very fantastic to have you on board. So uh, without you, we couldn't have built this kind of bridge between techies and filmmakers, which is actually the overall concept of the Wizard project. And hopefully there'll be much more synergy in the future. Finally, I'll also say a big thanks to our families at home because we have been working long nights, all of us, on this project. And uh, it's been great with the support that we have had from home. So uh, thanks for now. And uh, if I don't see you in the bar after this, the virtual bar, then uh, I hope we'll see you in the future somewhere and somehow. So thanks for now. <laughs>